Hello Avatar fans and welcome to the next episode of the Avatar Online podcast. This is going to be episode 233 of our regular shows and we are recording this on the 21st of August 2021. This is the official podcast for the fan site Avatar The Last Airbender Online.com and I'm going to be your main host Morgan Airspeed Prime. Joining me on the podcast is Greg, Greg2B from the site. What's up everyone? Excellent. So, on uh, this podcast, the plan is that we're going to cover two kind of important pieces of news, and then the main topic is going to be our review for uh, this year's free comic book day uh, Avatar and Korra comic. So we got uh, one of each in the book this year from Dark Horse. So we'll be going through both of those stories uh, in detail uh, when we get to it. Um, But before that... Uh, we do have some news to cover. So the first piece of news, we're, gra- we're going to cover some news here on the Netflix uh, uh, live action Avatar The Last Airbender. So a lot of the news prior to what happened in the last week or two um, was sort of primarily just like rumors, teases, like we didn't really know what to believe. Some of it I think turned out to be completely false. Some of it was actually completely correct. And what I thought was very interesting this time out is that we got the cast uh, members, the four main cast members, and they were actually leaked a week before the official announcement by uh, Avatar News, who seems to have a kind of inside source on the uh, live action (laughs) news. So I think he was the one to confirm initially that Albert Kim is the showrunner, which is confirmed. And now we have our four main cast members. So um, this is uh, so playing Ang is going to be uh, Gordon Cormier, or yeah, I think that's how you pronounce it. Uh, playing Katara is going to be uh, Kia Wentio. Um, playing Sokka is going to be Ian uh, Usley. Uh, I'm not sure about the pronunciation there. And playing Zuko is going to be uh, Dallas uh, Liu. Um, so. Uh, that's the sort of details that we have here. They also put out sort of descriptions for the characters, uh, but I think they're pretty accurate. The only difference here is that uh, they say Sokka is 16 when in the show he's 15, but that's relatively minor. Again, the early false rumors were that they were going to reverse the uh, <laughs> who was the older sibling between the two they haven't done that they're still saying Katara's uh, 14 but now they're saying Sokka's uh, 16 so um, that that's fine I don't think that changes uh, too much overall um, and then like I said um, Albert Kim is going to be the showrunner and the main news I suppose will be going through his sort of statement that he put out here But, uh, Greg, what are your thoughts on, I suppose, finally getting some confirmation on who's going to be playing these characters and so on? Yeah, I think, I don't know, I think it's interesting the process of how this got out, how we did get sort of like the rumor that was, you know, semi-official based off of, I think it was like based off of like social media posts and other like news activity that started spurring around, um, you know, getting the official castings. And then, of course, when we actually got the official castings came out and then everyone could actually, I guess, sort of officially sort of see it. But I guess there was like, and I'm sure you saw this, there's like a, a week of or maybe even more or so of like just people going based off of, you know, just sort of the early sort of speculation from Avatar News or, you know, eventually confirmed um, reports of that and just seeing, I guess, sort of just the initial sort of almost unofficial fan reaction to it leading up to, I guess, now we have the official reaction, which I guess by now most people have already, like, sort of either, you know, have their, like, opinions yay or nay on it. Um, So it's interesting just to see from that perspective how it was, you know, sort of let out early and then, you know, to actually get, like, the official statement and to see, you know, how people are now receiving it based off of, you know, the statement here, which we'll go over in a second. Mm -hmm. So, uh, yeah, um, the main thing that I think people are just in general happier about is, uh, of course, the sort of race of the cast is that it's it's much more in line with what you'd expect compared to the the last Airbender movie. Um, I don't think they've cast it, like, entirely, like, perfectly based on what we know as being the sort of main inspirations behind the nations within the show. But I feel there was always going to be a few filters that you have to go through in that, like, the Water Tribe is not directly equal to, like, 
Inuit and then you're casting an actor to play a character so you know there's two kind of transformations in a way that you have to go through so I think they've done a, a decent job here given that they're always going to want to choose the, I suppose the person who will give the best performance um, over being like hyper you know accurate to this or that and um, and in general, I haven't seen too much of a like negative reaction to uh, the, the the people that we have here playing our main characters. Um, in terms of, I suppose, what to expect here, it seems like the actor for Ang and Zuko both actually have sort of a martial arts experience and training, or at least sort of like action, sort of uh, athletic stuff. Um, so that's kind of uh, cool. That so it means like Ang Zuko fights, we should actually get some good ones uh, at the very least. Um, but uh, other than that, like I'm not I'm not familiar with I think any of these uh, actors beyond I suppose the the little bits I've seen people sort of hype up about them uh, since the announcement. Uh, do you have any specific thoughts on the actual you know, choices for the actors here? Are you familiar with any of them? No, I'm not per particularly familiar with any of them, and I've I've seen you know some of the stuff like you said online of people sort of mentioning them and sort of what they can bring to the roles, which is cool to see, especially the the more positive stuff that people have been posting about it. Um, so no, I mean it looks you know from all intents and purposes as you know good as it could be p potentially, it looks like it's on a, a decent track at least for now. Mm -hmm. And then yeah, the the only other thing to go off is Albert Kim put out a statement. So here's what he put out. Uh, this is all my daughter's fault. She's the one who got me hooked. When Avatar first uh, aired on Nickelodeon, she wasn't quite old enough to fully track the narrative, yet I'd find her glued to the TV every week, captivated by the adventures of Aang and his friends. Um, I began watching along with her, with the thought of helping her understand what was going on. But my dad's plainy duties quickly fell by the wayside as I found myself soaked into the world and characters and soon we were watching side by side, both of us swept away by the singular uh, mix of action, humour and epic storytelling. It also wasn't lost on me that this was a world that drew uh, from Asian cultures and legend, which is a rarity to this day and something I appreciated as an Asian American father, that my daughter was able to see characters who looked like her on screen and was more than entertaining, it was a gift. Flash forward 15 years, Netflix offers me the opportunity to develop a live action remake of Avatar. My first thought was, why? What is there I could do or say uh, with the story that wasn't done or said in the original? ATLA had only grown in popularity and acclaim over the last decade and a half, which is a testament to how complete and resonant a narrative experience it had been. So if it ain't broke, why fix it? But the more I thought about it, the more intrigued I became. VFX technology has advanced to the point where a live action version can not only faithfully translate what had already been done in animation, it can bring a rich new visual dimension to a fantastic world. We'd been able to see, uh, we, we'll be able to see bending in a real and visceral way we've never seen before. Um, I suppose we'll, we'll just cut it off there because I think the more interesting stuff comes afterwards. So this is all like pretty pretty standard, you know, you know, Avatar is so beloved, everyone has some sort of a kind of a relationship with the show at some point. So here's his connection. It is interesting that he was like, why are you even doing this in the first place? But then he thought of some interesting ideas but uh, do you have any thoughts on this sort of first half of his statement yeah i mean i i do agree that it is pretty sort of i guess you know standard of this sort of you know adaptation of a, a story which i guess is really only like so many ways you can explain your your interest in some of these so i guess that's not anything particularly new there i mean it's it's interesting that he does know you know about vfx technology and how that's sort of advanced and i think you know we've even mentioned before that you know even it on the original sort of movie you know it wasn't like the horriblest thing that they can do so it'll be interesting to see you know how much that statement stands up um because you know it definitely has advanced sense you know the previous movie um but you know there's also more issues that go into making vfx good than just you know the technology behind it you know mainly being budget and time so it'll be interesting to see how that you know blends with you know the overall storytelling that they're trying to do as well as just as they mentioned sort of the the format and 
and the sort of reimagining it and sort of how that'll take it along its path because you know netflix like every other sort of like streaming network um you know has their own particular way that they like to distribute their shows and you know release them um so it'll be interesting to see you know keeping that in mind how this actually um you know is just put out in general so that's definitely something to to keep in mind as this whole sort of endeavor goes forward Mm -hmm. Uh, also netflix format meant we had an opportunity to reimagine a story that had originally been told in self-contained half-hour episodes as an ongoing serialized narrative that meant story points and emotional arcs we loved in the original could be given even more room to breathe and grow so this is the thing that i probably like found the most interesting in that I kind of feel like I, I get what he's saying, but at the same time, like that fits certain points of Avatar, but not all of them in that the Netflix show is still going to be told in episodes as far as we're aware. So they're just going to be longer. So what's the, you know, what's the difference in a way? Like you're still going to have to do an episode that covers this much of the story um, versus ATLA did it in this many episodes. Now, Book one, obviously, in terms of its format, is the trickiest one to do because it is a bit all over the place outside of sort of the opening and ending grouping of episodes and then like one or two points in the middle. Everything else is sort of more standalone. So this maybe yeah. tells us about, you know, he's obviously thinking more about it. So book one at this point, that's what they're trying to do. Um, that they're maybe trying to make book one flow a little better rather than it being a kind of you know, we're here, now we're here, now we're over here type of thing. Uh, but uh, what are your thoughts on on this uh, statement here? Yeah, no, I, I do wonder that. I mean, I think, you know, like you said, this will be something that people will, you know, and this it's inevitable just a sort of comparison between, you know, the animated series and this live action adaptation of it. So it'll be interesting to see, you know, like you said, like the whole like idea of maybe like streamlining a few things and sort of making it flow a bit better rather than maybe being all over the place or maybe still having that sort of narrative, but maybe, you know, considering how it's probably going to be a lot shorter than the original, you know, series or original first book that, you know, maybe it'll be, you know, more along the lines of a montage type of thing or something like that. Or I don't know, there's, there's many different ways that they can do it. But yeah, that's definitely something to keep in mind because it, you know, it just, it has to be adapted in some way. And, you know, that's either going to work for you or not work for you. Mm hmm. Um, Let's see, what's next? Uh, finally, a live-action version would establish a new benchmark in representation and bring in a whole new generation of fans. This was a chance to showcase Asian and Indigenous characters as living, breathing people, not just a cartoon, not just in a cartoon, but in a world that truly exists, very familiar, similar to the one we live in. Uh, I also knew that what I didn't want to do, I didn't want to change things for the sake of change. I didn't want to modernize the story or twist it to fit current trends. Aang is not going to be a gritty anti-hero. Katara is not going to get curtain bangs. Uh, I was briefly tempted to give Sokka a TikTok account, though. Think of the possibilities as a joke. Um, Don't get me wrong, we'll be expanding and growing the world, and there will be surprises for existing fans and those new to the tale. But throughout the process, our byword has been authenticity. Uh, To the story, to the characters, to the cultural influences, authenticity is what keeps us going both in front of the camera and behind it, which is why we've assembled a team unlike any scene before, a group of talented and passionate artists who are working around the clock to bring this rich and incredible, incredibly beautiful world to life. But in the end, the reason I decided to do this came down to one thing. Somewhere out there, a young kid is sitting glued to their TV, waiting to be taken on an incredible journey, and I want to take them on it. I hope you'll come along too. So um, for me, I suppose the, the, the main thing in the rest of this is just this idea of like, he's saying like, okay, okay we want to be authentic. Um, we're not going to change stuff in this kind of big or crazy way, like some of the rumors have maybe suggested. Um, but at the same time as they're th- talking about authenticity and doing all this stuff that makes it accurate, they're also saying we will expand and grow the world and that it will surprise new and old fans. And this is where we get into that sort of kind of technical point of like, it's an adaptation, mm-hmm. but the creators have also left the show. So anything they knew, they do that's new, that expands on things, is not sort of technically canon. So it's a weird thing where 
they're not quite saying that like be aware this will be notably different in some way but it won't fully change the story so they're kind of they're kind of trying to say like all the right things without really you know mm-hmm. saying all that much uh wh- what's your take on on this yeah i mean they have to change something so and you know the idea of expanding i mean i don't know the idea of them expanding and growing and you know making things for new fans and existing fans i mean that doesn't you know to me personally that doesn't sound like the worst thing ever like even if it did have the original creators on it it always was going to be sort of its own thing in its own sort of universe because it just has to sort of you know function in that sort of way especially with just them adapting it to you know sort of like the real physicalities of like a real world and how that actually you know gets shown with you know real actors and everything so you know i don't know to me in my mind there was always going to be you know stuff that's not canon if you want to say or the whole thing could just not be canon it could just be you know its own thing that's just based off of you know the original show that we all know and really enjoy so no i mean to me that doesn't bother me too much i guess you know it's just you know how far are they willing to go and how much will that you know sort of off put people who you know are trying to give it you know sort of like an honest chance like you know there's always going to be people that regardless of what they do you know don't see the purpose of it being made at all but you know the idea of it's you know establishing a new idea of like representation which you know is always a good thing and that's something that's you know really big these days so like there's nothing you know wrong with trying to go that way and for people who do prefer you know live action shows which for the most part is still you know a lot of people or most people in general you know this definitely has the potential to add things to that you know sort of story and that sort of idea there so you know even though you know making live adaptations of animated shows is always sort of like a hard and tricky thing and can only be really be done right in like certain ways um you know there's still something to be said to do it if you know it's done right or you know as well as it can be done so i don't know i think it's definitely you know per you know this whole sort of piece here and what he's going on about you know it seems like you know on the surface level at least they're coming at it from like you know an idea of like you know sincerity and trying to put things in the right place and if they do have you know this team that's you know really willing to do as much as they can and they have you know the backing behind it um to actually do that then you know it sounds like at least has the potential to be something you know interesting Mm, yeah and 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 again like a lot of the skepticism that's still present with this show even though i suppose this announcement was like not met with too much negativity there's still just people who aren't really interested in the show comes from the fact that you can't forget that mike and brian left this project because of creative differences that what they wanted to do like the creators of the franchise what they wanted to do with the same concept they basically kind of weren't allowed to do because of creative differences so you know what's changed i guess the time that's half passed between has kind of we've, we've got through this sort of era where like avatar is like super respected now where it took the return to netflix for that to become like abundantly clear everyone always respected it but now if you're doing something with avatar you have to do it right or you'll be heavily heavily criticized um but uh yeah the the thing here is obviously going to be like what do they do and what do they don't do book one's going to be very tricky to do uh what do they have to include like i suppose a, a, an easy question is just like what what did the last airbender movie do that was wrong obviously the sort of like directing script was probably the main problem in terms of overall quality but in terms of like what content from the show they did and did not adapt where did they go wrong and what most people will probably say is that they left out basically all of the side support characters completely they like turned roku into like a random spirit dragon and didn't make it clear what exactly it was um i think they cut the kyoshi warriors head of the final movie um there was no boomy no like haru tyro really um you know any of that stuff it was pretty much they did the opening stuff uh, in the water tribe southern water tribe southern air temple at the end they did the northern water tribe in the middle all they really did was sort of like 
general Earth Kingdom stuff. They did the Blue Spirit thing. They tied sort of the comic relics in a little bit. And that was really about it because the movie was only, I think, like 90 minutes long. If they want to be authentic here, I think probably the main thing is just you can't not have Suki for sure. You <laughs> probably have to have Boomy in there somewhere. They're the sort of things that will get you heavy criticism if you don't like announce them. That especially with all the sort of Kyoshi hype, Suki hype recently, you can't not do Suki. Uh, that's probably one of the big things. But then similarly, there's stuff like Jet, Zhang Zhang, Teo the Mechanist. A lot of the episodes that aren't really part of the opening and ending do introduce something new, but they are more kind of standalone episodes. So how are they going to make that all flow nicely together? Uh, and that's probably the big kind of uh, thing that they're talking about. But um, I suppose, what are, what are your thoughts on that? Like, h how do they do this more effectively than the last Airbender movie? Yeah, I mean, you know, at least per the format, at least they do have, you know, more time than the movie. Um, so, you know, there's, there's that hope in considering that. Now, I do wonder, you know, how they're actually going to sort of break things down over, I guess, you know, seasons or maybe multiple seasons in terms of, you know, the books. So that'll be interesting to see because, I mean, you know, they really could if they have, you know, the backing and it's worth it and it's popular enough to, you know, really extend things out. Um, but, you know, realistically, I mean, I think, you know, there are ways that they could go about sort of, you know, mentioning those characters or even sort of, you know, adding them in there and sort of may be more sort of like major scenes where there are more sort of like group scenes or something like that where they actually can sort of you know have them in there incorporated in some way even if they are not able to sort of you know give you know characters like you said like boomy and the mechanism and sort of them their own sort of you know essentially you know like you said standalone episodes so i think you know there definitely are ways that they can incorporate them after they get sort of like you know the basic introduction of our you know our main three characters and then sort of you know going on from that and yeah like you said you know not having the kyoshi warriors with all of the the hype with that um definitely seems like something that i don't know anyone who's like sort of paying attention to like recent events in avatar would be you know kind of silly not to have that included in some form or fashion um so you know i don't know i don't i would really hope that they wouldn't sort of miss out on having you know that character you know suki and you know the group in hopefully you know a pretty decent capacity or was at least as much as they had in the original show which you know many people will criticize for you know suki not having enough time so you know there's something to be seen for that maybe they can do that better and that would be something that people might actually you know gravitate more towards this series if they actually did it that way mm. yeah and the thing for me is that i would prefer that the show actually moved some stuff around to where it is clearly different in structure to the atla because if they try and do sort of a shot for shot remake um that's when you're going to basically ask for the heavy criticism of every little thing that you do um <clears throat> that's not entirely accurate is going to be brought to the surface but if you are making sort of like changes to you know just tell the story in a different way then it's clear that like okay it's it's not canon in any way but it's just a different way of telling the story that's kind of what i actually want to just see the interesting way they do it obviously the level of changes are like you shouldn't be changing sort of the main story beats um or characters that are involved in certain spots but the way you get to those moments i think yeah you can change them in that uh, i did a video video earlier on this week sort of going through like book one and what are the key things in each episode that you kind of need to pull out of that episode and say something like say the fortune teller that's not really an episode you need to do in any way in full <laughs> katara can visit a fortune teller in a quick like one two minute scene at like any point in the middle of the story it can still be aunt Wu, it can still be makapu but you don't necessarily have to have the whole volcano thing happen the whole comedic episode with Sokka being frustrated by everything going on and you know Mang, Ang, that sort of stuff but just the the fortune you'll marry a powerful bender and then Ang doing something powerful where the connection is made can happen as a result of something else like 
maybe Aang when he faces Zhao at the end of the Deserter or something like that. You can combine a group of the episodes together that that way, um, and that's you know probably something they're going to have to do. Um, and then in terms of expansion, I've always said this for for ages that the the last ever the movie, I think the two things that it did pretty well were Aang's arc with water bending that he actually struggles with it and the whole flow like water mm -hmm. piece of music uh, that builds up in, in the finale. I actually like that rather than in the show. Aang has no problem with water bending. It's not a challenge at all. So that's something you can do to expand it out, link that into the loss of his people, which also isn't covered a lot in the show. So relics probably should be included like it is in the last airbender movie, that comic. Um, and then the other thing is just the I think the movie makes it a lot clearer that the group traveling through the Earth Kingdom prompts at least a little bit of a sort of rebellion from the Earth Kingdom people against the Fire Nation. And it's one of the few times you really get a sense that like the war is an ongoing thing between the Earth Kingdom and the Fire Nation. At least I think they, they make that clear in the show in the movie but it's it's really heavily skipped over the whole the wars going on in the show um and they're perhaps the moments to expand on things um but uh, it, it, what, what do you think are the obvious spots things they can do in book one to expand uh, the the world and character arcs you know i think that you make a good point there the whole idea of the this being sort of like an ongoing war effort um, just because of, you know, the scale of, you know, the Fire Nation, you know, trying to essentially take over the world. I mean, I guess, you know, from a narrative perspective and from it being, you know, sort of, you know, obviously geared at kids overall, that that's something that's, you know, not as heavily focused on. Um, but I think, you know, that's something that can be, you know, explained a lot more in detail and even though they mentioned in you know in this little report here about you know not wanting to make you know ang and the whole thing sort of like a dark and gritty thing which is like you know the current trend of a lot of shows these days but i think you know with it being live action maybe being able to show you know more of the mature you know sort of ideas of you know this being an actual ongoing war effort that's been going on for, you know, a hundred of years so far. So I think maybe going along those lines without, you know, without making it, you know, so, you know, depressing and dramatic that, you know, everyone starts to have like, you know, like the worst sense of everything for the show, because, you know, the show is still, you know, it's about, you know, hope and aspiring for, you know, a better world. So I think, you know, there's definitely a lot of that that they can take into account, but, you know, adding, you know, maybe a touch more of maturity to it might not actually be the worst thing. And it being sort of a live action thing, I think that might actually help it more than hurt it since, you know, going the more sort of, I guess, comedic way might, you know, be a bad way of potentially, you know, representing sort of the realism of the situation that is actually going on in the world. Mm. Yeah, because because I think that's one of the heavier criticisms about the last Airbender movie is that like, it's there's no there's very little comedy in it like at all. Um, but the 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 reason I've always often like defended a little bit the movie on that front is just that they can't. I don't think they can do the same humor that the show can. In that, say, one hundred five, King of Amashu. You, I don't think you can do that episode super super accurately in live action without changing the tone quite a bit the whole you know kangaroo island that place is pretty hopping you know even the whole disguise as bonzu pippin paddle opsicopolis um it's very exaggerated and it works in the animation but live action characters doing that i'm not sure you can make that work so well um and you know Boomy is still going to be important, but he's probably going to be one of those characters you maybe have to sort of uh, rein in a little bit. Uh, you can still have him have his kind of uh, unique sort of crazy edge, but um, trying to be overly accurate with that probably, you know, isn't going to work. And and there's moments like that throughout that you kind of have to kind of rein in a little bit. Um, so we'll, we'll see how that goes. Um, again, I think on the actually seeing this stuff happen eventually obviously four actors isn't the entire show there has to be lots of other characters um cast as well uh i think at this stage 
November is what I've been hearing about when they're actually going to start filming. So it's been pretty heavily delayed. Um, so we're still not really near like seeing the big stuff of like seeing these actors in their costumes on sets. But I suppose it'll get here quicker than other stuff in that I still expect we'll hear big news about this before any Avatar Studios project. Um, but uh, what, what are your thoughts just on that about like the, the progress of this so far? Yeah, I mean, I guess it can kind of seem like right now, like a set, like a a jump up in terms of you know the show actually moving forward and stuff. But it's still, you know, like any production is still going to take time to actually you know get the locations, to film everything, and then all the post production and stuff that has to go into it, and you know all the marketing and all that stuff. So I mean, this is like the really like the actual like beginning of things even though we've known about this for you know quite a while at this point but this is really just sort of getting started now and i guess it probably you know like you said it probably will come faster than we think and i don't know i guess it is interesting to compare this with you know what avatar studios is actually doing and you know the progress of both of them going forward but in terms of i guess you know current news at least this definitely seems like this has like the time start advantage on it i mean granted it did have you know a number of years in sort of pseudo development even if a lot of that might have you know not be used now um but yeah it definitely you no know, it's coming for sure so it'll be interesting to see how this goes forward and all the, the news that comes from it and if we get any more i guess rumors about it earlier than we think we might i don't know mm -hmm. yeah so so this is something to keep an eye on as we go forward um after our studios of course we're still we still have the info it's basically all the information just from february went back at the initial announcement that the movie is the first project it's meant to begin production this year but we haven't actually heard any news whatsoever about that in that the most avatar studios news we've got is that uh the kickstarter which we're going to go on to next uh magpie games are working with avatar studios on their stuff and jeremy zuckerman's also part of the team but that's it like we don't know anyone else uh even though we assume Avatar Studios is hard at work on whatever's going on. We just don't know right now. So, um, yeah, we'll, we'll move on, like I said, to the Kickstarter. So, uh, on the last podcast, I believe we were talking about the sort of uh, preview of the Kickstarter. It hadn't actually gone live yet. I think it was two or three days before the, the backing uh, campaign was actually going to begin. And now we are, uh, you know, more or less the core of three weeks into the campaign and it's been doing incredibly well i think when we did some speculation on the podcast i said you know for sure it'll do over a million and then i think after the show we had a bit of a discussion and was kind of i was kind of thinking like i think it'll do in or around two million and i think you were maybe thinking like a little less than that which is actually what most people were saying that I, I put up a poll I think the day before on my YouTube channel and the majority of people were thinking that this would only do like just over a million and very very few people were thinking it would do over two million uh, and very few people more than that but where we stand now 12 days to go we're at 6.68 million dollars so uh it's been doing really really well it is now i think within the top 20 kickstarters of all time it's like for sure the number one rpg kickstarter of all time and it's looking like it's on track to do probably at least 8 million maybe a little bit over that it depends on how big the the late rush in the final few days is but way beyond what i expected and it just kind of highlights that I think a lot of this, like a lot of this has to be put down to just, it is a big avatar thing rather than necessarily the hype being around the actual game system as such. It's, I think more about like, <laughs> it's a big avatar project. It's the first avatar legends project. And there's a lot of official stuff going on here. And that feels kind of cool. Everyone wants to be involved. Um, you know, there's hype behind the game, of course, but um, I think so much of this is just this is how invested avatar fans are at this point that if this was something else related a, a different type of game or whatever it'd be doing just as well 
Um, but uh, wh- what are your thoughts, uh, just to start us off here, on you know how successful this has been so far? Nearly seven million after only three weeks. You know, I think your assessment of the popularity of the Avatar world, um, you know, having a huge impact in you know how well this Kickstarter um, is actually doing, you know, compared to maybe the actual idea of you know the game mechanics and the game functions itself. Um, I think you know there are you know a lot of people, and I'm sure you've seen like a lot of stuff on message boards and stuff like that, where people are you know pretty interested in the game and trying to understand the system. You know, comparing it to D and D, even though it's actually a different system and comparative to that. And there is definitely a lot of you know promotion on it as well, just in terms of you know people who've actually played like um the preview games that you can do through Magpie Games and stuff like that. So you know there's still there's a lot of, I guess, just noise of it in general, but, you know, I think, you know, it also is just generally showing, you know, just the popularity of the franchise in general, despite, you know, from some aspects, depending on who you talk to and not being as popular as it should have been or as people thought it would have been, um, you know, however you configure that, you know, clearly this is showing that it has something behind it, um, that might be pushing it forward considering that it is you know like you said one of the top on kickstarter and you know up there or the most of you know actual rpg games or however you classify that um tabletop role-playing games on kickstarter itself um so yeah no there's definitely a lot of factors that goes into this doing as well as it currently is beyond just you know sort of the idea of the game itself um which i'm sure we'll go into mm-hmm so yeah, uh, the other I big I suppose big stat is current number of backers is uh, fifty four thousand two hundred and forty seven right now, and um, so uh, that's a lot of people um, for sure. Uh, Twelve days to go, <laughs> of course, um, but uh, the big thing is uh, I suppose let's go through the current I suppose status of the rewards, uh, the the kind of uh, stretch goals basically, <laughs> and where we're at on this because. You know, I, I I love how they do the updates on this. Of like initially the the image, of course we we kind of pre unlocked a few things like the cloth map, the dice pack, and the the mm-hmm. cards, and it was like oh that's that's pretty cool. But now it's this like super crowded image with like ten different books on the page and stuff like that. Um, there's a lot of stuff here, but um, we'll just go through uh, basically all of the things we've unlocked. So, dice pack, uh, cloth map combat action deck uh fabric dice bag uh the core playbook uh, or basically kind of character archetype the adamant npc legend tenzin core playbook the pillar adventure booklet one and we'll come back to the adventure booklets as like a separate topic you know once we're done here discussing the whole group of everything that you get so adventure booklet one earth and root uh, the journal pack npc legend azula um playbook the elder journal design for water adventure booklet 2 fire and brimstone npc legend suki playbook the razor book uh, adventure booklet 3 ash and steel uh, journal design for earth npc legend Sokka, playbook the destined journal design for fire katara as an npc legend adventure booklet 4 air and wind the foundling playbook air journal design to complete that set uh npc legend the sami adventure booklet 5 to complete this set water and mist kuvira tylee zuko npc legends expanded play booklet white lotus tile as a physical item uh, the most recent thing we unlocked at six million was uh, an avatar legends tabletop rpg companion app uh, to help you play the game including dice rolling guided character creation and campaign management and the thing we're looking to get towards which we definitely will in the next few days over seven million (laughs) one sheet tongs adventure guide so a lot of stuff um it is interesting that they have stopped doing sort of npc legends about like halfway through basically there's a lot of characters who don't appear to be there but there's actually more included than you think and that the most obvious character who's missing is Toph but they're saying Toph is included in one of the adventure booklets but we'll, we'll, we'll get to that. Uh, what are your thoughts on just uh, everything they've sort of added as stretch goals as this has went on and on? It's a lot of stuff. I was really just like 
I don't know. It was interesting to see, you know, as, you know, it got funded more and more and how they just had to, like, add things on and on and, you know, how it was just, you know, pretty quickly surpassed pretty much, you know, most of the initial. I think maybe, I think the ones that took the longest maybe was, like, the compan- last couple ones maybe were the last ones that seemed to take, like, a little bit longer to actually achieve. But most of the other ones, they seemed to get them, you know, relatively quickly um which is interesting because i think you know from what a lot of people are saying like usually it's like the initial you know couple days of a kickstarter for this type of thing is where everything is and then it's also at like the end rush like you mentioned earlier so it's interesting to see you know it have i guess some sort of sustain even though now it dev- definitely seems like it's sort of like you know sort of like crest a little bit at this point um but you know we'll we'll see it's still going like if you go to the page you know however they do their system it still seems to be you know going up a little bit by little bit um so yeah no it's definitely a lot of stuff i mean it almost seems like to me too much stuff like i definitely wasn't you know expecting to get you know all of these items and some of them are just you know digital items that will sort of be included and some of the other ones are you know physical items that you can actually you know use as well um so no it's definitely something to see with all of this being added and added and you know i mean there's a lot in the world so you know i guess realistically you know they wouldn't really run out of stuff um but it's almost like you know what are you going to keep adding you know that makes sense to add it for the game mm. Yeah, and it's just one of those things, like, I read out a list of, like, 20 things there, but when you really compile it down, what we're at now, given that two or three of those things was sort of just either completing a set, or, like, this reward compiles these other rewards together, and then this reward compiles these mm-hmm. two compiles together, uh, is that you're basically getting, say, you know, you're getting the all the physical stuff. You're going to get your core book, which is the what the Kickstarter is for, at this stage, like let, let's assume we get the seven million. There's no way we're not going to at this point. All the other items basically are compiled into one other hardcover book. So your core items basically are two hardcover books, and then you just have the set of five kind of journals, which are just like notebooks basically. Uh, they don't seem like super big, but you get the five different designs. You get a dice pack and a bag for them. You get the little white lotus tile. And a combat action deck in addition to the uh, map thing so you know you, you basically get your sort of play mat the dice and all the stuff to go with it they're saying the white lotus tile is like a map marker uh no no pads and the two books like it, it's pretty simple because like all those characters <laughs> they haven't exactly said what they are in terms of like actual digital material but i'm guessing that's like two three pages of content on how this character works how you actually go about playing them uh, and it's not a huge amount of info all the stuff about like the character types again is like two like pages of a pdf just explaining how you actually create that type of character and um, and again all of that is now going to be in a big book called um what's it called wanchi tongs adventure guide or something like that yeah wanchi tongs adventure guide so yeah the other thing to do here is to go through um yeah, all of these adventure booklets. So I think the the obvious comparison here is that this is these are basically meant to sort of be the equivalence to the Forbidden Scroll story from the Quick Start Guide. So you're basically getting a one sort of set story that's a little bit more guided, so you have sort of less work to do to come up with the story yourself. Mm-hmm. One for each of the five eras in the game. So the first one is the Kyoshi era. It's called Earth and Root. And what it says is this. In this Kyoshi era adventure, you've been given the task of hunting down a notorious Dao Fei by the renowned firebender Rangi while she attends to her duties as companion to the Avatar. You must prove yourself by stopping this villain before Rangi returns from her latest travels. So, pretty cool. Rangi gets a mention. Everyone freaks out about that because she's a fan favorite. And I'm guessing, based on the fact that they said Toph is included in one of these, that this probably means Rangi is included as an NPC legend here, because otherwise, Kyoshi is the only Kyoshi era NPC legend. So it makes sense. Rangi's mentioned here. We're more than likely Rangi's here. So that's pretty cool. Um, but uh, yeah, do you, have, do you have any thoughts on this? Uh, do you think there'll be sort of more Kyoshi info in these books? 
Um, I mean, I think there's definitely going to be some, you know, more information on it, just in terms of, you know, how you actually, you know, guide the users or the DM or however, um, you know, along, you know, this actual story path. So, I mean, I think the idea of these adventure booklets, in addition to sort of like, you know, sort of the other, you know, sort of more guided stuff from the actual core book is probably, you know, for me personally, one of the more interesting things just to see, you know, how they're actually, you know, guiding or how you would guide your, your players along their actual story here and see, you know, what everyone sort of, you know, makes of that, um, I think is definitely going to be an interesting thing to see. Mm. Yeah, I think to me with the Kyoshi one, the, the main thing I'd be looking for is like when they say you're hunting down the Dao Fei, like, are they going to give us the name of like a new Dao Fei group that we've never heard about before? That's, you know, a little thing that I'd maybe hope they mention. Uh, the other thing is obviously for, I, I suppose, mainly uh, this uh, Kyoshi era, Roku era, and then the Hundred Year War era. They're the three that I suppose even hardcore Avatar fans probably do need a bit of help with to construct the story properly, just because we have the least amount of content for those eras um, and especially if people haven't read the novels they wouldn't know a lot about the Kyoshi era um, <clears throat> adventure booklet 2 it says this Roku era adventure begins with a visit to the Fire Nation capital waterbending master Takukak uh, discovered a hidden cache of stolen Earth Kingdom crates filled with meteorite metal while Takukak uh, keeps up appearances during his visit you must unearth the truth behind this suspicious theft and again, they've clarified that uh, the core book features like brand new canonical information about the Roku era. So I guess this sort of continues that on. I'm guessing Takukak mm. is a Roku era NPC legend. Uh, I don't know who he is in that like, and the the trying to connect dots with the show. I think like, is this the guy who thought Roku waterbending? But I they might have said that if that was the case. Either way, we don't know for sure, but. There's an option here. But yeah, pretty cool. Meteorite mention, getting a mention before <laughs> uh, the era that we find out about it in sounds pretty cool. But uh, do you have any thoughts on uh, this one? Yeah, I like this one. This is more like a, a undercover type of story where you're trying to sort of figuring out things um, without sort of getting caught. So no, I, I don't know, I like the idea of this one. This one seems like one of the funner ones, I think, for me personally. Mm -hmm. Book of Three, Ash and Steel, is uh, in the 100 Year War era adventure. You've been asked to provide security for a Fire Nation defector who is offering war plans stolen from Fire Lord Ozai's palace in exchange for asylum in Ba Sing Se. As the machinations of Grand Secretariat Long Feng unfold, you must decide who to trust in this <laughs> web of lies. So I'm guessing NPC legend Long Feng, perhaps? maybe Ozai maybe. Uh, I don't know um, but yeah th this seems very like 100 year war era in the show era type thing of like okay Long Fang conspiracy embossing say you know Earth Kingdom <laughs> Fire Nation sort of politics due to the war um, pretty interesting again hopefully there's more information on this era but uh, your, your thoughts yeah, no, Long Fang doing sort of Long Fang things and how, you know, the whole system is sort of being hidden behind the scenes. I think, you know, if you like that part of the actual show, which I think a lot of people did, that this sounds like a really good one. Mm -hmm. Adventure Book of Four is the Ang era book, Air and Wind. In this Ang era adventure, an archaeological expedition has discovered a cache of lost Air Nomad scrolls, but the corporation that funded the dig intends to seize the artifact and exploit them. You must help the dig team reach the safety of Toph's metal bending academy before it's too late. So, this is where Toph is going to be as an NPC <laughs> legend. Uh, obviously, they've clarified that the Ang era is post imbalance, so it makes sense that the academy is mm -hmm. up and running. And uh, yeah, it also I think makes sense that you know I guess in this kind of era of peace, a few years after uh, the war has come to an end, that sure people will be investigating the. Uh, air temples and they'd be finding air nomad stuff it'd be cool if the story here is fully canon to a degree um that like this is how a lot of air nomad stuff gets found because of these teams or something like that but still a uh, pretty cool story here <laughs> re referencing a lot of the comic material but uh your own thoughts yeah, no, I mean, I guess I would hope that a lot of, you know, and we sort of got this sort of more or less that a lot of the stuff, you know, 
will play into the world and you know some sort of real way i mean i guess it's kind of hard to have it you know fully mesh with everything just because these are you know at the end of the day going to be like user adaptive stories but there's definitely a lot of key things here that i wonder you know since this is you know working with you know avatar studios and everything are you know some of these ideas actually going to be you know incorporated into you know what we actually see in terms of the movie and future series and the mini stuff and all that stuff um but the idea of this being sort of like you know after the war there's not you no know, there's not a, a big evil you know at this time at least it's more just sort of like you know the corporate evil and the corporate greed so i mean i don't know it seems like this is like probably the most like realistic corporate or real world thing you know within the avatar world that you know we have as sort of like a story currently that you know works really well so i don't know i think this is a cool one just because it has that sort of angle to it mm. yeah I, I suppose my main hope for these is just that like sure because it's sort of you know play your own version of the story there's a certain like okay it's not canon but because these are so guided, like especially if you look at the Forbidden Scroll one from the quick start, it's guided through almost mm -hmm. like day by day, and it always ends with a fight. Regardless of what way you do the story, a fight always takes place <laughs> between you and the villain, at least in that story. And so I wouldn't mind if there was just like sort of canonically this is the sort of series of events that actually happens in that like this character actually exists like that fire sage from that story actually exists and the idea is that he does defect in this way or whatever uh, in the same way that like okay archaeological expeditions did find these air nomad scrolls this happened and they were saved by being escorted to Toph's metal bending academy and you can just say that sort of canonically it was just a group of people and then that's the sort of story you know aspect of the game that is kind of made up that yeah. canonically would never be go go into detail but it's like you did that type thing and um, final adventure booklet water and mist in this Korra era adventure president julie moon's husband varick has gone uh, missing after attending a pro bending <laughs> match while julie grapples with politics that keep the republic city police tied up you are put on the case so this one seems pretty cool i'm guessing varick will be the npc legend here um it could be julie but i'm thinking varick more so because uh i think if you play a tech character they probably need the most sort of support to have someone to learn skills from and varick would make sense to be like a really obvious one of them but it might be both of them we're not really sure um pro bending is not going to be introduced until the uh, republic city kind of which is like the second expansion book which they've just mentioned is going to be a secondary thing they haven't mentioned like what way they're doing it it's not part of this kickstarter but uh i'm not sure how they're actually going to go about doing it but uh yeah cool yeah. idea for a story but uh any thoughts here yeah i mean i don't this seems like pretty spot on in terms of something that would happen like the idea of Barrett going missing and having this sort of cap or you know recapture him or just find him i mean it could really be anything it could just be very doing very things for all you know but you know that's the whole fun part of working with him as a character in the story mm -hmm. and yeah it's nice to know like say pro bending like oh yeah it's, it's still going on of course it'd be cool if some of the details on this one do mention some some new teams or something like that and um, that would always be a nice option um especially like ahead of i assume the full republic city book featuring quite heavy i think they've already mm -hmm. said it's going to feature how to play uh, pro bending properly this is just using it as sort of a backdrop but um still really really cool um while we're still on these pledge things the only other thing i want to mention is that uh we get to see, we get a look at a few sort of new pieces of art that like we've never seen before on the kickstarter page so I think the most obvious ones are the Suki. When they have the NPC legend Suki, that art of Suki is brand new. I, I've never seen that piece of art before. And it looks sort of really new, really clean, um, and different than the sort of more old school, sort of like 2005 to 2008 sort of stock art style. So that's kind of cool. Um, I think, what else do we have? The Tai Li image also is new. The Zuko image is the one that we saw on the Topps trading card game page for the, the Zuko card. So 
that sort of double confirmation that okay there's some new stock art of the main cast um so that's kind of interesting uh also if you look at some of the kind of uh update banners there's an interesting image of uh ang that's completely new um another one of zuko with swords that's also new as well so that's very interesting to me like they, they're obviously getting this art officially from nickelodeon slash avatar studios and it's just really interesting to me that it's not all the really overused stock pieces of art there are some new <laughs> stuff in here so uh, what are your thoughts on some of this new stuff that we've seen yeah no i think that's definitely i don't know i guess we we always make note of like sort of like the classic stock art um just because we've seen it so much ourselves so the fact that they are you know generating new assets or at least you know using ones that we don't see all the time is definitely a a welcome change from our perspective and even i guess in their in their trailer that they have for the kickstarter there's you know some new art that they've or new you know just animations in general that they've sort of designed around you know this whole kickstarter that they're trying to push out and promote so you know there you can see that there is you know you know some i guess you know effort being put into pushing you know newer stuff out which is good to see considering that there is you know this whole you know new machine that's going out producing avatar content now yeah i just kind of really want like to know like okay well, where can we see all of this new art or like is there going to be something released that features it all i'm guessing we'll see some <laughs> of it when the tops cards you know ship and we get to see what's on them for sure um i think they've just been delayed i think they according to what i said on the website they were meant to ship but they haven't shipped yet i think tops just in general is a bit behind on everything so that's why that's happening and um, the only other thing is in relation to the wanshi tong adventure guide obviously what it is is it's compiling all of the different adventure booklets together into one book combined with all the details on the npc legends and the uh character the new character sheets information but what it says is this um the Wanchi Tong Adventure Guide is an upgraded uh, 8.5 by 11 inch hardcover version of all five adventure booklets alongside all the legends and playbook unlocked during the campaign and some new material. This supplement will have new material featuring the all-knowing spirit Wanchi Tong and his incredible spirit library. Uh, what spirit, uh, what secrets uh, will you discover among the tomes and scrolls kept by the elder spirit? What adventures will you undertake? Just remember, you must offer something to the library to take anything of value. So come prepared with knowledge he does not yet know. So my, my thing with this is like, are they saying that like the extra Roku information, we're going to learn new things about Wan Shi Tong? Or is this just another sort of guided story that more relates to the library? Um, I'm not really sure about that, but I'm taking this as a, we'll at least learn a few little bits and pieces about Wan Chi Tong, because they're not clarifying <laughs> like what era this as such is, um, because they're not doing the spirit world yet, so I, get, I guess it has to be one of the first three eras, Kyoshi, Roku, or Hundred Year War. Uh, because it can't be the Ang one, because his library is in the spirit, spirit world, and the same with the Korra era. So, um, still really cool. Um, they do say Elder Spirit, which I don't think is spirit terminology we'd ever heard before. We hear like all powerful spirit for Rava and Vatu, but Elder Spirit is actually a probably a decent name to refer to spirits like Wan Shi Tong, Ko, probably Father Glowworm, just the. The really be really notable spirits that are different than your sort of like eye eyes or um carrot guy type spirits just the random ones um but yeah what are your thoughts on this and an even newer edition here once we hit seven million yeah i mean i don't know i think it seems like they're just you know coming out with more and more stuff which is cool to see and if this is more of a guided story through you know the library i think that's definitely a worthy sort of inclusion in this overall you know collection of what they're going for here and you know, i don't know i wonder how much of it will really be like new information and stuff like that but i think you know at the very least getting sort of a guided story um or just you know being able to you know interact with um, wang shi tong you know via your characters i think is a cool addition mm -hmm. so yeah that's uh that um <clears throat> the the i suppose the final thing to mention is that 
when they when they hit just about four million, they sort of revealed that we've basically ran out of uh, stretch goals because it was so successful they blew through them all like really really quickly. So in between four and five million, they had to go to Nickelodeon Viacom and get approval on upcoming stretch goals. So there was actually a delay before they announced that the five million stretch goal was the White Lotus tile. There was a delay <laughs> revealing the uh, the companion app and this guide adventure guidebook as well. And I'm guessing there'll be at least one or two more final stretch goals. Um, as we enter the final stage of the campaign, which I'm guessing they're going through approval right now. They did reveal a kind of interesting thing that it, when they send something to Viacom for approval for an avatar thing, that it does typically take 10 plus days for it to go through whatever process to get confirmed, which seems kind of crazy considering like all they wanted to do was add like a white lotus tile, a tiny plastic white lotus tile with a little bit of printing on the top to this game that they needed to get such heavy approval on it. Now I understand for like an app, sure, you need to get massive approval for that. The Wanchi Tong information needs approval. So, you know, it just helps to explain a little bit of the, the process a bit. Um, in terms of, like, I suppose where we're, we're looking overall, uh, there is some interesting stats. Like, of course, the, the first uh, four days were kind of pretty crazy. Uh, and then since then, like the days following, that was about like 300k per day. We're now at currently a situation where most of the days have been like 1.25, uh, 125,000 uh, a day uh, and so on in terms of like the actual stats. And that, that, that's why I say like we're at what, 6.7 or so at the moment, uh, 6.68. Within the, the, the next two, three days, we're going to hit 7 million. And then it will accelerate up towards the end, um, like I think it always does. Because I think anyone who's followed the Kickstarter will get like an email on the like 48 hour warning point. And I think a lot of people yeah. uh, <laughs> go in at that point at the end. So um, the expectations are that like it's saying, looking at a sort of stat tracker thing here, it says it's trending toward 10.8 million. Uh, but obviously that's not entirely, you know, super, super accurate. It's just a, uh, a an estimate sort of thing. But yeah, it, it seems like the general idea is that for sure we'll hit somewhere between 8 and like 10, 11 by the end, depending on how successful it is. So at the very least, there'll probably be one more um, stretch goal. Um, I'd love to know what information they have sort of behind the scenes in terms of like, how do they plan ahead? Just how big of a stretch goal should they put at the end? Because I think 10 million would be a mm. huge milestone and it would be interesting to see what they actually uh, did there. But um, yeah, wh where do you think it's going to end up with uh, at the end of the what, 30, 31 days? I don't know. I mean, this already surpassed what I thought it might make. And, it, you know, like you said, it, if it does keep trending up as it seems to be doing, I mean, you know, it can get pretty much up there. I mean, I do wonder, you know, like you said, what will be like the next set of goals? I mean, I don't really know, you know, what much more they would want to include in this. I know I've seen a lot of people, you know, have suggested, you know, other things online in terms of, you know, media that they could potentially add with this or, you know, comparing it to sort of other, you know, board games that have come up or have attempted to come out for Avatar, um, you know, in terms of other, you know, items or physical items that they could add to it. But, you know, as you mentioned before, with the, the process for approval, since this is, you know, an official licensed thing from, you know, CBS Viacom and, you know, with the process that they have to go through to actually make things, which to me doesn't seem that long that it takes that long to add anything to this. Um, but, you know, considering that process and considering how long that they have to go in this, the 12 days, I mean, getting those approvals, you know, might not actually come through for the end, but I'm sure, like you said before, um, they're already sort of trying to speculate and think of where they can actually go from this. So I don't know. I mean, I don't know, 8 seems fine, 9 seems fine, I guess 10, that seems a bit, 
high to me, but, you know, who knows? I mean, you know, with the last surge of people getting in on this and, you know, people who are just, you know, drawn to the idea of this in general, regardless of if they have, like, a super, you know, hardcore interest in playing the game, you know, just being a fan in general or, you know, just hearing about it. Like, I've seen a lot of that as well. It's just, you know, people being drawn to this just because of the, the fan interaction in general and just the community aspect of this being a really popular thing. Um, you know, and people just sort of finding out of, about the show because of the Kickstarter. I think that's, you know, something cool to see um, in terms of just, you know, buzz in general and how, you know, things get, you know, brought up across the internet and stuff. So, I don't know, I think it's it's cool to see and just the, the follow from, like, a spectator's perspective and being interested in it. Yeah, and, and the other thing is that, like, it seems like they're marketing this quite heavily and that, like, every time I go on Facebook, I see, like, a an, an ad for this game. Uh, and I've seen them, like, elsewhere as well. So uh, they're definitely putting the, the, the kind of time, I guess, and money in to make sure that people know about this, um, which is definitely kind of good to see. Um, in terms of, like, what they can add in, uh, the only thing I can immediately think of is that, like, now that, like, okay, if you get any physical tier, you're for sure getting two books. Uh, the only thing I can predict maybe is, like, a kind of case type thing, a box to put the two books in, because uh, I think they did that mm. on Root right at the end, and they could do that here now that there's two hardcover books uh, with some nice art on the outside. That would seem like a nice extra thing that wouldn't add too much, because I guess they could then ship the two books in that to kind of keep them together. <laughs> um, that that's an option. Beyond that, like. At this stage, I can't see them adding in any more NPC Legends. They'd be kind of weird stretch goals this high up as like the last ones. Um, and there's not going to be anything, I suppose, too substantial to add to the game. So it's going to have to be something like that, just an extra little kind of physical item or something like that. So uh, not sure, but uh, yeah, it's going to be exciting to see what actually happens how high up the list it actually gets because I think like the, the the most heavily backed thing on Kickstarter I think is like 20 million for like uh, like a smartwatch type thing um, from a few years ago and um, so it has to get I suppose more in the like I think 12 million range to get into like the top 10 or 5 so uh, either way it's it's it's, it's interesting um, but uh, yeah the, the only other thing is that uh, there was an interesting thing that they posted about a few days ago with regards to the highest tier that there was only 12,000 copies of the deluxe dice set that would be available to ship on their sort of planned ship date. That isn't, they've now fulfilled all that. There are 12,000 backers at that tier. So they've opened up the same tier, but like late shipping for the second batch of the special dice and special dice bag. Uh, again, limited to 12,000, but there's loads of them left. Um, that was just interesting to kind of consider. But uh, yeah, I guess because they're made of obsidian, I guess there's a lot of material that they need to, to make them. Uh, yeah. So there's <laughs> that. Um, but yeah, th th this has been really cool to follow, just seeing all the, the imagery and the extra stuff that they're adding in. And I'm guessing they're going to do something similar for the, the other two books when they come out. We'll, we'll see exactly what they have a plan for. But uh, yeah. The, it's been really cool to see just how successful it's been. So um, yeah, I guess that means we can end the news and uh, jump into our main topic, which is going to be our review for the Free Comic Book Day 2021 Avatar and Korra issue. Uh, and obviously Free Comic Book Day was on the 14th, so it was a week ago. Um, the reason we didn't do it last week was because uh, I don't think we, we we would have had any way to actually get the comic because like very, everyone was looking for it on last Saturday and like no one really had it and stuff like that so it was a bit of a kind of rush to kind of get everything together but uh, it's it's more available now but there's still it's still not super available there's been a lot of sort of issues with regards to shipping places actually getting their free comics because of COVID, of course, some people don't even want to go out to get it. The digital copy, the official digital copy, has not gone live yet. But they said it is, is coming out towards the end of August. I think someone messaged them and they said the 25th 
is when they're going to put it up. So that should definitely help things in being available like officially, uh, especially because once people started to hear about what the book is actually about, everyone wanted to read it like straight away. Um, so let's get into it here. So we've got uh, two short stories to cover here. The Korra one is called uh, Clearing the Air and the Avatar one is called Matcha Makers. Um, so we're going to start with the Korra comic, Clearing the Air. So the script is by Kiku Hughes, art is by Sam Beck, colors by Killian Ng, let lettering by Richard Starkings and Comic Crafts Jimmy Betancourt, and then the cover art for the overall comic was by Sam Beck with Killian Ng as well. So that's that. Um, and I suppose yeah, we'll, we'll just really quickly, like usual, some general thoughts here at the start, and then we'll go through it sort of page by page. Uh, overall, Greg, what are your thoughts on clearing the air? We had nothing to go on really for like expectations for what this comic was going to be about but uh for in the end once we got to see it what were your thoughts um no i think this one turned out to be a fairly like interesting one um just you know in terms of the actual sort of backstory flashback scene that we actually get in this which i think you know for the most part it's like the first time we really are getting something like this and you know a lot of people have been talking about this especially with you know tenzin being you know fan favorite character um you know and you know of course it you know including uh ang as well i think you know that's drawn a lot of people towards this story and i think you know for the most part, this is overshadowed, you know, the second part of this comic because it is a, a two part here. But I think for once, this one, which I guess, you know, it does have Aang in it. So it does have, you know, sort of the, the original sort of people's pull into it as well. Um, but, you know, it's taken, you know, a lot of people, you know, interest in, you know, this sort of side of the story, which I think is something that we don't normally see um, overall, just in terms of the fandom and, you know, when it's split in times. Yeah, th this was a really interesting comic because, like I said, th there was a bit of a problem, I suppose, with the fact that they didn't do a great job at sort of promoting this like ahead of time in that we only got the cover like a week or two before the event. And then there was the only description mm -hmm. of the book was the most vague description ever. And then at least the writer for the Iroh comic said a general idea of what it's going to be about. With this book, all we had to go on was the cover. And the cover makes you believe that, okay, you know, Air Kid Focus, you know, Janora, Iki, that seems kind of cool if they do anything with them. But it looks like it's just going to be about them arguing. So, like, the expectations very much in check of, like, uh, it, it could be fun, but we'll, we'll see what they do. I don't get why they didn't put out some sort of description, like, market this book, like, go to Free Comic Book Day to get this book because you will see... Tenzin as a teenager you'll see the backstory they did the exact same thing with the Suki comic where like they never promoted ahead of time that Suki's backstory is featured in the book when that's probably the most interesting part of the book so um I understand like to a degree keeping it as, as a surprise but the backstory is like 90% of this story so it, it's it's almost the, the cover almost feels a bit weird in that sense because it's not about Janora and Iki. That's just like the setup for Tenzin telling his story. Uh, I think the book is really, really strong. It's just I, I don't get what way they're marketing these uh, some of these books and with the decision making. But uh, let's go through it anyway. So clearing the air, we start off. We're on Air Temple Island. We see Tenzin trying to uh, meditate, uh, but there's a big noise. Bam! And he immediately is a bit annoyed by this, so he rushes inside and finds um, Milo, Janora, and Iki all <laughs> making uh, a big fuss here inside. Chaos in this room. Uh, Milo's flying around on an air scooter, and like the cover suggests, it is Janora and Iki sort of just screaming at each other, arguing here. Uh, Janora points out that uh, Iki tore your scroll, and we see the, the scroll on the wall has been pretty <laughs> badly torn. Iki says it was an accident, but uh, Janora says, tell that to the metal bending police when they come and take you to jail. Tenzin has enough of this and just says, sit down all of you, I'm going to tell you a story from my childhood. Iki does comment, I think I'd rather go to jail. 
And we go into the flashback as Tenzin says, I'm pretending I didn't hear that. This happened when I was just a few years older than you, Janora. So, uh, Greg, what are your thoughts on the sort of setup or like the, the framing before we get into the, the flashback? Yeah, I mean, the the framing is sort of uh, classic for what would happen with, uh, you know, Tenzin and his family here. And even though they're, you know, older here and a bit more mature, you know, they're still, you know, siblings and they have that sort of, you know, interactions with each other, which is, you know, fun to see just, you know, to add that sort of like realism that, you know, even though they're, you know, highly regarded by, I guess, a lot of the world, you know, they're still like a family at heart and still have these sort of issues. Um, so no, I think that's a nice sort of setup here and Tenzin being sort of, Tenzin is sort of trying to control the situation and, you know, one of the ways that he sees would be sort of fit for this, uh, uh, situation that they have going on. Mm. Yeah, I think the only thing I'd say here is just like with Janora, um, I keep wanting sort of like more from her, especially now that she's a master airbender. And, you know, she's like 14 in this story. Um, that's the same age as Katara was at the start. And they do tend to very much always characterize the, the kids when they're together as arguing like at all times, which does, I think, get slightly in the way of like Janora's sort of like development that she's had. Um and they, you know, they, they need to, I think, just uh, have a book that features Janora and kind of puts her in the spotlight that we sort of expect of her. But again, this was just here to get into the flashback rather than being the focus of the story in that, as we'll see at the end, this argument doesn't really get, like, resolved. It's just, this is how it is. This is not something to resolve <laughs> by clearing the air. It's just, you know, sibling banter back and forth, basically. But we jump into the flashback here, and this is the majority of this story. So we immediately cut to a, I guess, 16 or 17 year old Tenzin. Uh, they don't give an exact age, but like uh, he said here, um, this happened when I was just a few years older than you, Janora. So Janora's 14. Um, so, you know, a few years, at least two. So it's 16, 17, or 18. Uh, I'm guessing at 17, just because I, I see a few parallels between this story and then Korra in the first episode of Korra um but uh, we'll, we'll yeah. get to that so we see uh, Tenzin of course um l looking kind of younger here uh, on Air Temple Island and suddenly there's smoke coming from the uh the spinning gates and we see that there is a teenage waterbender and a teenage firebender uh, here defacing them so they've uh, kind of burned some drawings of Aang looking weird uh, onto the gates they're doing a pretty cool uh, dual uh, bending move here where they're keeping the firebender from like completely burning the gates down by having the guy put water basically where he's doing a little jet of fire so it, it has the burn effect on the wood but it doesn't completely set it on fire uh, but Tenzin rushes over here tells him to stop they run off and Tenzin actually gets really angry here and chases after them. Uh, the waterbender gets them on a bit of a kind of makeshift raft and kind of waterbends them out to sea. Tenzin chases on his glider. They get up on the dock here and Tenzin just sort of goes to town on them here and like airbending kick, <laughs> does a little bit of damage, sends them flying, effortlessly blocks the firebender's blast and then blasts them into the ground. But as he's about to take out the waterbender, some metal bender cops come and, you know, wrap the cables around him and the two uh, kind of hooligans here. And they're like, uh, wait, isn't this the Avatar's kid? Chief Bei Fong is going to want to see this. So, um, yeah, we get to see a kind of frustrated uh, Tenzin here doing a little bit of uh, vigilante justice here for what's happening on the island. Um, what are your thoughts on this? Yeah, no, it's it's interesting just to see, you know, um, Tenzin as like a younger, more brash version of his, you know, more mature self that we see, you know, later on, which there's definitely, you know, glimpses of him, you know, being more sort of, you know, angry or upset at situations. You know, he's he's far from from perfect, as we see later on, um, which, you know, they make note of. But it's interesting just to see where he started here and how that later on, you know, goes in the story of sort of, you know, actually clearing the air. But, you know, the initial, you know, 
functions that we see here of him, you know, using his bending to sort of capture them. And, you know, you can see that he's obviously pretty skilled at this point. Um, so, you know, he really doesn't have, you know, much of a hard time also just being, I guess, sort of airbending in general. Like, that's not something that pretty much anyone has had a lot of interaction with. So, you know, these kids obviously wouldn't be, like, the best opponents for him or anything like that. Um, even though, you know, like you mentioned, their technique for doing the sort of graffiti on the, the air gaze is, you know, pretty, I guess, sort of unique. It shows that they're able to sort of work in coordination there, which, of course, goes hand in hand with what happens later on. Um, but, you yeah, know, it's... Uh, a good sort of setup for Tenzin's sort of troubles here and you know just to see that he isn't quite the perfect sort of you know airbending um you no know, son yet yeah like like we know even adult Tenzin has like a a little bit of a sort of short fuse he can get angry quite easily like the whole don't bring my mother into this and kind of situations like that <laughs> uh is it just seeing that when it's kind of almost even worse kind of still a little bit more of a problem and uh, he even in the scene with Ang later, he yeah. like, specifically like references it like that. He is kind of angry at times. Um, the only other comment I'd have here is that the design of the Firebender boy is like exactly it is Shikamaru from Naruto, like a hundred percent. But uh, <laughs> that's uh, cool anyway. So uh, yeah, we cut to the uh, Republic City Police headquarters here, and uh, the three boys have been put right in front of Chief. Toph, of course. So she says, uh, I, I gotta say, I'm not surprised to see you two troublemakers in here again, but Tenzin, are airbenders getting into street brawls now? As much as I love a good fight, you kids uh, broke the law and could have broken some bones too if my officers hadn't stepped in. Tenzin tries to defend himself here. Uh, Chief Beifong, they were defacing our airbending gates. They're centuries old and these two uh, these these jerks were, were burning them. I couldn't let them just get away with it. She says, I see, but rather than report it to us, you thought you'd do a little vigilante justice, and he can't really defend himself here. Uh, but there was a knock at the door, and Tav is like, oh, well, just good, just what we need. And she says, your dad, as Ang walks in, he's like, nice to see you too, Toph. Um, so I suppose we'll do this sort of page by page here, because this is this is an important backstory here with all these characters involved. Um, this scene obviously feels very much like Korra is caught by the metal bender officers and put in front of Lin, and then Tenzin walks in to the, defend her. This is the previous generation's version of that. Tenzin brought in before Toph, Aang comes in to defend him. Really kind of cool kind of parallel there. Um, and especially just to see kind of, I suppose in, in a way, the difference between Toph as the chief and Lin as the chief is that Toph's a lot more relaxed, sort of chill here, whereas Lin is very sort of highly strung with Korra, uh, whereas she's mm -hmm. just like, yeah, I understand a lot of this stuff. You did break the law, though, so we have to do something about it, whereas Lin's just like, you're in a lot of trouble, young lady. Um, but uh, yeah, what are your <laughs> thoughts on this? Yeah, no, that, that is a good point of comparison, Dan. And I think, you know, that's just probably, like, the characters. And, you know, Lynn herself was going through, I guess, just a lot of, you know, stress in general during that period of time. So, you know, there's something to be seen there in just her character in general, you know, for all the, the issues that she still had to work out with her family, you know, probably was a lot more stressful than, you know, maybe what Toph was going through at this point in time. But no, I definitely like the, the comparisons um, between the two of them. I know this would have been, even though this is obviously like a, a post story here, it would have been cool if, you know, Tenzin could have like relayed the story to Korra at some point, or even if it was like at the end when they were more like comfortable with each other. Like, you know, one time I had a run in with, you know, Toph and, you know, talk about how that went and went down but no i think you know the setup for this and to have you know and come in here and sort of you know start to become the mediator of this situation i think you know it's, it's a nice sort of you know call back and just shows you how you know tenzin had to at least i guess initially deal with this sort of situation mm -hmm. so ang says your deputy filled me in on what happened i'm sorry for tenzin's part in this we'll of course pay for any public property that may have been damaged Toph says don't worry your pretty bald head nothing was damaged but your gates as for the fight i'm letting tenzin off with a warning we go easy on first time offenders unlike these two who will be spending the night in the slammer and she turns from being really relaxed here to being sort of like very much taking joy in uh <laughs> 
I suppose trying to scare the other two boys straight here by threatening them with a, a minor stay in jail, they do begin to freak out. Aang is like, uh, hold on there, Toph. Um, if they've only damaged Air Nation property, they're in our jurisdiction. I'd appreciate you your letting me take these kids back to Air Temple Island now. And she says, uh, why do you delight in undermining my authority, Twinkletoes? It's just my favorite part of our complicated friendship. And so they head out of the um, police headquarters and Aang heads to his uh, his parked transport out here at the front. And who is it? It's uh, <laughs> it's Appa right there in between some uh, Saddlemobiles or whatever, cars. Um, and I think this is this is our first time seeing like older Appa, I believe. So he's like all aboard and there's our older Appa looking great as usual so um really really fun here just to, to see this whole dynamic back and forth this feels very much like the little bit of their dynamic that you saw in the sort of yakone backstory from cora of like she yeah. still calls him twinkle toes but like he's uh, more kind of he's older now and so on but um really really fun stuff uh, what are your thoughts on this page yeah, no, the the dynamic that they have, you know, it stems, you know, back from when they first met each other to when they were a bit older. And, you know, I think that's it's really nice to see how that plays out here and how they do have this sort of, you know, complicated relationship or friendship that they have here. And just, you know, I don't know, it's interesting just because of how, you know, that works with someone who's, you know, technically you know, is respected by everyone, but doesn't really have, like, sort of, like, a, an official sort of, like, you know, say in, you know, affairs, but because of that, they have, like, the prestige around them, and, you know, being that, you know, Toph is, you know, pretty close friends with him, you know, they're able to sort of figure out how that dynamic should work here, but, yeah, no, I think it's, it's cool just to see, you know, Toph sort of, you know, basically, like you said, try to scare the kids straight here, but Aang has a, another approach that, you know, might be more beneficial for them. Mm-hmm. So, uh, next page, uh, we see the boys begin to sort of freak out a bit here. I'm really sorry, Mr. Avatar. Please don't take away our bending. And he's like, I would never. I, I'd never do that to children over some graffiti. I promise you're not in that much trouble. There's an Air Nation tradition I'd like to share with you all. That's all. Uh, we'll have you home by dinner. So, Tenzin gets a bit upset at this because he thinks Aang isn't being very serious about what these two actually did. He's like, what if they mess up the saddle or what if they hurt Appa? And he's, Aang says, that's not fair, Tenzin. There's a big difference between vandalism and actually harming a living being. Now, come on up, please. So they get on Appa and he's like, Appa, yip, yip. Um, this page is kind of important, so we'll just cover the, the first half here. Obviously, the, the most interesting thing here probably is that the kids, the, the, the two teens here who are in trouble, feel that Aang is going to take their bending away. So they're familiar that the Avatar has this power. Uh, and that's because in the timeline, I guess, they know either that he took the Fire Lord's bending away or the Akon incident, which uh, had to have happened before this. Mm -hmm. I think that's the way it works. And that in Korra, Tarlok said it took place 42 years ago. Tenzin's 50 in that scene. So Tenzin was eight when that happened and he's like double that age here so like about eight nine years ago the Akone incident happened and they're probably familiar with that or at least the uh, Ozai thing that's why they're afraid about it and Aang has to explain that he never do that so that's cool with the timeline a nice reference to that scene and so on but your thoughts on this kind of part of the page yeah no I thought that was pretty interesting that they would make mention that because that's like a pretty serious like you know thing to happen um and the fact that the the kids hear that that's something that could potentially happen to them is pretty you know it definitely seems like it you know it, it puts a, a pause to ang here so you know so i don't know it's a really good callback and it's really you know i guess it shows like the potential severity of what could happen or at least what the kids think um which you know obviously it's, it's not that big um to ang here and he's sort of trying to sort of mediate and sort of play this down but you can see that tenzin still you know doesn't quite understand uh the situation here or what ang's actually going for mm -hmm. and then yeah uh, on top of appa the conversation continues uh Tenzin, uh, Tenzin says, I, I can't believe you're just going to let them get away with everything. I know you're going to tell me this is why I haven't earned my arrows. 
because I'm not supposed to get angry or use my bending to attack, even when they deserve it. They deserved it, and I'm supposed to keep uh, Air Nation culture alive, but because of them, I couldn't even protect the airbending gates. So, a very frustrated uh, Tenzin here with this situation. But Aang just says, Tenzin, the gates aren't important. You are. You could never let me down, just as you could never let the Air Nation, let down the Air Nation. We live on in you. I'm sorry that you have to bear that responsibility, but I trust you wholeheartedly with it. And so, if you're up for it, I'd like you to lead us in resolving this conflict. Traditionally, the head monk would oversee all disputes and help both the offender and the victim come to a resolution. Tenzin says, but I don't know what to do. And Aang says that he will guide him through it as they arrive back on the island. So, um... Yeah, we see the the sort of frustrations of Tenzin in this scene, but what 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 are your thoughts on it? Yeah, I mean, clearly Tenzin is having you know some doubts about you know the situation and how Aang's going to deal with it, but it looks like you know Aang's already planned on how this is actually going to sort of go down, and he also you know is imparting you know some more you know culture, just sort of the idea of it into Tenzin here. So you know, as always, Aang seems to like try to turn everything, even like the little things, into sort of like a a teaching moment. Um, and you know, I think there's you know something to be said here because he is saying like you know traditionally you know the head monk would oversee all the disputes. So I don't, I think it's cool that we're getting you know this little tidbit in here, which you know even Aang himself you know wasn't exactly like. You know super old when he was you know originally left the temple so the fact that he's able to sort of like impart this knowledge you know seems like it's pretty you know important here and i think that's something that tenzin is you know starting to come to grasp with mm, yeah like uh, i like this scene it, it's, it's really quick like it's only like a panel or two but just referencing you know like his frustrations that he sort of knows himself that you know maybe part of the reason he doesn't have his arrow tattoos mm-hmm. is that He's maybe a little bit too highly strong about to some things. He does take things too seriously, which is, I think, what Katara says about about him in like the early episodes. He he is quite serious, um, and so like seeing that in action was actually like really good to see that he struggles with the idea of like you know you know air nomads being pacifists, but then sometimes you do need to you know take down people with 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 your bending and so on, and that. You know, we always view him as being like he's laser focused on, you know, keeping the Air Nation culture alive, and he is. He wants it, of course, but he struggles almost with a little bit of that pressure that, like, he technically, I suppose, failed because the gates got damaged, and uh, he thinks that he's kind of a failure for that. But Ang just lets him know that, like, I, I understand, like, it's a lot of pressure just to be put only on you, but uh, I think you can do it. So it's it, it's a it's a really really nice scene. To, to get that across um, but yeah and then we get the, the final few pages here so uh, Aang uh, with them all kind of uh, in front of him they're all sat down cross legged uh, in the Air Nation when someone uh, someone wronged another person the guilty party wasn't put behind bars instead an elder monk would call the victim and the offender to meet the victim began by expressing how they were harmed and what they needed in order to heal then the offender would have a chance to apologize and suggest ways to make amends once everyone felt heard and respected the monk would lead the group through a recirculation ritual everyone took part in cleansing the air uh, it was an act of purification, a way to restore balance to one's spirit and to the community. So as he's explaining this to them, we see it's sort of actually happening. So uh, Tenzin creates a spiral of air in between him and the other two boys. The waterbender adds like a spiral of water to that. And then the firebender adds, uh, I guess, his best version of a spiral of fire to that. It does result in sort of smoke being sort of like spread out which i guess is the combination of these three elements and this is their sort of purification ritual doing <laughs> this together uh but then they go on they have the sort of like the buckets and stuff like that and they're trying to clean the sort of burn marks off the uh the gates as best possible and they do this all together like tenzin's involved here along with the two boys and it seems like they get along pretty well by the end and actually become friends. So on the final page here, we see up on sort of the balcony, um, Aang talking to Katara. 
Uh, I wish it was always this easy to keep the peace. And Katara says, yes, but he's young. Let him have the easy ones for now. And look, he made friends. Uh, and then we cut back to the sort of present day out of the flashback. And we see that the air kids are still arguing. Uh, Janor says, stop it. Milo says, I'm cleansing the air. As he just blows air <laughs> in the middle of all of them. And, and <laughs> Janor is like, it's not your turn. I'm the leader. Uh, so it's not going so well here as... Cora and Asami walk into the room and Cora's like, oh, what happened here? And he just says, the peaceful resolution of a conflict. So just getting across that this ritual worked for him in the past, but uh, the issue between his kids is like, you can't really solve it in exactly the same way. But, uh, you know, pretty fun ending here, getting to see Cora again, you see Katara as well, uh, and highlighting that, oh, this is how the Air Nomads handle disputes that like yeah they don't have a jail i suppose um you do maybe wonder for serious issues what they do uh, is it just banishment or something like that but here's how they handle more kind of minor to medium uh type of conflicts and it, it's a very air nomad approach here to have a ritual like this um so it is pretty cool i'm just realizing that like tenzin is really angry at these boys but actually they could get on quite well together and you know they're not going to do this anymore this incident here i'm being pretty cool about it having them resolve it in this way they might go on to do something better now or something like this more so than spending a night in prison like toff was planning to do so ang handling this situation probably will work out better for these two in the long run but you know that's just some speculation but what are your thoughts on the uh, the final two pages here <laughs> Yeah, no, I, I like the idea of this, you know, really being the way that, like you said, the nomads would handle, you know, some offenses in, you know, in their nation. And I do wonder, I mean, I guess if there was anything more serious, like we've seen in sort of like, you know, the novels, you know, would it just be complete excommunication and you sort of have to figure out your own, um, you know, are there different levels to how they would sort of do this sort of, you know, ritual that would resolve these, you know, conflicts within them. Um, so I don't know. And it's also interesting that this is sort of with, I guess, sort of like, you know, other people that aren't just, you know, air nomads. So, you know, that could always be sort of like hit or miss just because of, you know, just the differences in opinions and how they were sort of brought up. So it's probably something that's, you know, probably easier to do when, you know, everyone's sort of an air nomad versus, you know, a more integrated, you know, society. So, I don't know, but it seems to have worked in this case. And if it is, you know, as they say on the end, you know, definitely looks like Tenzin has made some friends. I mean, I wonder if they would ever come back later on. That would be interesting to see, you know, just sort of what they are up to now. But in terms of how well it worked for his family, um, it definitely doesn't seem like that's something that is quite going to be the, the perfect resolution that he might have hoped for, um, which I guess, you know, within a family that might be a bit harder to sort of understand, you know, that sort of concept, or especially with uh, Milo just being sort of Milo in general. But, you know, it was a nice story he tried here and it's, it's nice to see Korra and Asami here at the end as well. Mm, yeah, and you bring a, a good point that like uh, Kelsong in the uh, Kyoshi novels is more or less like what way do they handle it? They, they just like, they don't tr have his name in a place of honor at any of the temples yeah. because of what he did, which was uh, basically hel helping to protect the coast, but he killed pirates in the process uh, because of the storm that he created and they view this as being a major problem that he's um this has affected his like spirituality so he doesn't get the same treatment as other um maybe even like less important air nomads compared to kelsong and it just like highlights that the the, the air nomads really value sort of like spiritual purity and i suppose if you do something that is just they feel is inherently wrong that's maybe one of the weaknesses of kind of their approach of like, can do they do the cleanse in the air thing if they if something is like truly, really really bad, um. But you know, in this case, this is how they handle the minor ones, and that's kind of interesting. But overall, it's just th this backstory is so interesting because it's like only the I suppose third time we've ever really seen this era. It was the sort of Yakon backstory uh it was the lynn backstory um and then we get to see that again 
every Avatar fan wants to see more of this era. In that the <laughs> the most talking points that have come out of this was just like, oh, I would have loved it if we got to see this character or this character in this book, and just to know what's going on during this era. And it highlights that you know, yeah, like Korra is coming up to like being ten years old uh, early next year. It's been a really long time since Avatar came to an end. We need more of this. We need stuff to fill this out. And it's why everyone does want some Avatar content out of Avatar Studios to fill this gap out a little bit more. More heavily cover this era that we're in right now. Uh, that that this, this flashback covers. Because it is really, really interesting to see, you know, you know a young Tenzin. To see Aang acting as a father this more of this please basically um because yeah like people were saying like oh i wonder where like kaya is or where boomy is but obviously tenzin is the youngest sibling so boomy we can only speculate about the exact ages of them but like boomy looks to be at least like potentially 10 years older than um tenzin so that would make him like 27 or so at this he's probably in the united forces so that's why he's not here Kaya yeah. <laughs> is probably, you know, what, five years older or so than, than Tenzin. So she's probably out finding herself, like like we, we heard about, or something like that. So it makes sense in this story why it's Tenzin's sort of the focus here. Uh, and then Lin, I, I suppose, timeline-wise, this has to be relatively close to when the Lin and uh, Sue incident happens. It's probably like the year before that or something like that. Um, maybe a year or two involved in that, but it's pretty close. Because, uh, of course, that's the result that basically that leads to Toph resigning, but she's still the chief here. Um, you sort of wonder, like, oh, when does Tenzin and uh, uh, Lin's relationship happen? It's obviously not this early. So, you know, th- th- there's a lot of little things like that that's kind of cool. But... Um, yeah, just uh, overall, now that we've gone through it, just uh, what were your kind of thoughts on just the fact that they finally, after all this time, did a story that features more of this backstory to the gap between the two shows? Yeah, I think they did it really well. I mean, I think, you know, it was obviously a very sort of focused story here and of course, it was also very short as well, since this is in the free comic book day comic. So it's not like they could go really in depth with it, which is probably like, you know, like you were talking about, you know, all the other characters they potentially could have included didn't even, you know, bother to like touch any of them because it just, you know, it wouldn't have worked in the amount of pages that they have here. But it definitely, if nothing else, it just shows that, you know, people are interested in stories in this era and, you know, it wouldn't be something that people would look down on actually having of, which I think, you know, was probably already, like, well-known. Like, it's, it's nothing it's nothing new that people want story of Aang when he's older, which, you know, is, like, what, you know, most people are speculating Avatar Studios will actually do. So, you know, it's cool to actually get some content in this era that's uh, official. Mm-hmm. The second story is an Avatar story. It's uh, Matcha Makers. The story is by Nadia Shamas and Ser- Sarah uh, Alphage. Um, script is by Nadia Shamas. Art by Sarah Alphage. Uh, colors by Savannah Ganucho. Uh, lettering by Richard Starkings and Comic Crafts uh, Jimmy Betancourt. So, uh, Matcha Makers, uh, we open up here. Uh, I suppose, yeah, g- general thoughts on this, actually. Uh, so, overall, Greg, before we get into it, what were your thoughts on the Iro story? <laughs> um, no, this was a cool one. It was uh, pretty, I guess, a little bit surprising just to see, in general, just, you know, getting another story for Iro um, in this sort of era where he's sort of running to the tea shop and, you know, just with everything that's happened with him is one that I don't see a lot of people talking about online, which I think is interesting because, you know, Iroh is a pretty, you know, fan favorite character. And yeah, overall, in the grand scheme of things, this story doesn't really have like, you know, like a big pull or anything like that. And, you know, nothing could be said of this relationship going forward. But, you know, it does have some interesting bits. It does have the spirits, which seems to draw a lot of people to, you know, the stories in general. So, no, I think it's it's a nice sort of, like, side story just for, for Iroh, just to see what he's doing post the war and everything. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and, and, and for me, like, this one, like, 
the spirit stuff obviously adds a lot to it, I think, because that's an aspect of Iroh that we know is important to his character, but we knew more about the spiritual stuff from his Korra appearances more so than his Avatar stuff. So it's actually really interesting to see mm -hmm. the spiritual stuff uh, amplified here while I guess this is more in the sort of imbalance era style thing rather than it being set like way past everything. So, you know, still portals closed, lots of spirits around him. That's really interesting to get across that he is sort of the genora of his era where spirits are always around him that's how spiritual he is that's a cool thing to get and then to add this kind of little arc about like him feeling that like he, he's had so many life experiences like there's no way he can have a relationship but actually why not <laughs> uh, the, 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 it's actually it's just a fun solo story for Ira. there's definitely a, a point in it where i think they could have done more with it to give it like a a big piece of information to maybe rival the first story but uh, we'll get to that so it opens up in the jasmine dragon iroh's tea shop of course in bossing say we see the day is beginning to come to an end here and it's iroh and yeah, the person he has working for him here at the shop uh, feng uh, she is serving sort of the last tea of the day basically and he says uh, feng you can take off that apron and head home for the night uh, and she's like there's still one more customer left and he says don't worry you get some rest go ahead and enjoy the nightlife you have better places to be she says thanks and so uh, iroh comes over to serve tea to the last customer uh, he's, he goes over to her and says, anything else I can get for you? She says, uh, oh no, thank you. I'm sorry for keeping you past closing. I was just enjoying this tea so much. I wanted to savor it. He says, please, no, no apologies necessary. I'm just happy to our tea brought you such pleasure. Uh, and she says, it's not only the tea. And then she gets flustered and says, uh, I, I mean, you have a really special shop here. Uh, Iroh says, uh, I can't take all the credit. I have some wonderful helpers. And of course, excellent repeat customers. She says her name is uh, Lee May. He says his name is Iroh. She's just like, a, I know. Uh, I'm pleased to make your acquaintance, Lee May. And there's an interesting panel at the end where there's some sort of flowers kind of blooming around the panel, um, highlighting um, how kind of well this is going. So uh, yeah, an interesting kind of start here. I suppose we get our sort of uh, Iroh romance story here in the same way that uh, Tales of Bossing Say had a sort of Zuko romance story. So here's uh, other people forcing Iroh into a kind of a romantic situation. He's quite, he's maybe questioning a little bit. So that's an interesting note. But uh, your thoughts on these uh, opening two pages here? Yeah, no, I, the idea of you know Iroh potentially having you know a relationship here, or just you know sort of meeting someone and being introduced to them, um, you no, know, in his you know. In his tea shop here i think it's you know it's a very nice setup for what this story is actually going for considering you know i you know is sort of just sort of you know pretty like chill overall um and especially in this era here and it is interesting that they do try to sort of bring some focus to sort of their you know first initial meeting here and sort of you know leading where that may go yeah and, it, and it's interesting because like um he does have an aspect to his character of like he kind of is like a <laughs> like ladies man as we've seen before uh where like he, tr he tried to like charm the, mm -hmm. the was it the the port officer like, like full moon bay or whatever it was half moon bay um and I, there, I think there's another instance of like something similar to that so like he has a bit of a charm going on but he's not doing that here so it kind of makes it come across that like no there's a proper connection here he's not just trying to sort of like manipulate someone here or anything um so he says uh, it looks like you have some tea leaves at the bottom of your cup may i so she gives it to him he looks into the remaining tea leaves and says it looks like a swan a swan symbolizes good luck and a new love uh, uh, and <laughs> she touches his hand and says i certainly hope so and there's a a blush scene here of course um, I better get going until next time I'll be here and again we, we, we they leave with just the idea of like oh kind of love is in the air here uh, as the day comes to an end so um, yeah they're, they're really hitting it quite hard here that like oh this is something that could actually happen uh, you you don't get the impression from these first three pages that Iroh is like against something happening here 
Uh, but uh, what are your thoughts on this page? Yeah, no, I think you're right along that. Is right now it seems like you know they both seem interested in each other, um, you know, and they even have this sort of like little back and forth there with the dialogue there. So yeah, definitely right now I would say it definitely seems like this is a, a potential thing that could happen. Mm -hmm. And then we cut to I suppose uh, much later in the night. It's uh, dark outside. Uh, Iro is preparing some more tea, uh, but for someone different. Uh, so we see the different like ingredients that go into the tea, the different kind of uh, pots and kind of um, mugs and stuff like that that he uses to create it, the teapot and so on. Uh, and then he, he has it all set up, like m multiple kind of uh, bowls out, as we cut to a lot of spirits, you know, kind of a uh, book two spirits style spirits, uh, little kind of cute kind of... Uh, things all over the place here like a little mushroom in the background there um very kind of cute looking spirits he says hello again friends i have something special for you all today i call it the white lotus tile it's a pale tea very delicate but layered with sweetness complexity and strength so he puts it down and uh, some of the spirits begin to sort of drink it some of them get into it and begin to sort of like swim around in it uh, but they all seem to like it he says uh it reminds me of someone I just met, actually. Ah, uh, but those days are long behind me. I've lived a long life with many challenges, but also many victories. I finally reached a place where I'm content. Not many people are lucky enough to have such fortune. And it's a foolish person who asks for more when he already has so much. Perhaps it's best to leave things as they are now. And uh, as we go to the next panel, we see a kind of zoom in on one of the kind of uh, cups he's been holding on to is the one that Lee May had her um, tea in and it still has a little bit of her lipstick on it. So he has been holding on to it, even though he's saying that he's too old basically for this. He shouldn't have this. He's already had a, a great life. There's, there's no there's no way something super good should happen to him again after that. So an, an interesting um, reflection for Iroh, again, the idea that he's amazing at giving other people advice, but uh, maybe not uh, taking his own advice to heart here. But uh, what are your thoughts on uh, these two pages here and the, the spirit reveal here? Yeah, no, I, I really like the, the spirit reveal here. And yeah, it is very sort of like core period, time period of sort of seeing the spirits, which is, you know, pretty unique to see in the previous sort of era that we've seen. So, you know, the idea that we have like, you know, all these sort of different unique spirits and like a, a fox spirit, it looks like, I think, um, you know, it's pretty, you know, interesting just to see, you know, I wrote sort of, I guess, general like interaction with them, or at least initially, um, you know, it seems like he's on pretty good terms with them and everything and you know making this sort of unique or a new blended type of tea here but yeah he definitely does get you know sort of quite introspective on sort of like the day's events here and sort of thinking that maybe he's had you know too good of a life already that he doesn't really need much more but we'll see if that sort of holds true mm -hmm. so um from here we cut to sort of the next day uh, and Feng notices that, oh, that woman again, she must have really liked the tea. And I was like, oh, really? Is she there? Uh, I mean, could you attend to her? I've got something, got to get something from the back. So it's just that idea of like, yeah, she gets excited at the prospect of seeing her again, but then realizes he, he made his decision last night that he's not going to pursue it. Um, so Feng goes over to serve uh, tea to Li Mei. But suddenly the spirits are revealed to be around again. And uh, from behind uh, one of the plant pots, uh, they, I guess, th this is an interesting thing in terms of like, it's not particularly clear, like, do they throw it or do some spirits have like telepathy or something like that? They basically make a piece of uh, paper sort of float over to like right under her uh, uh, Fang's foot. So she slips on it when she comes down here. Uh, and doesn't get the opportunity to serve tea because she spills it. So she tries to help, Li Mei tries to help Fang up. Um, this is when Iroh comes over and is just like, I'll serve tea to her, uh, you take a break. Uh, and so we see him sort of setting up the tea uh, and so on. But as he has it prepared, he looks away temporarily 
and, and out of one of the kind of pots beside it, the spirits again pop out and they sort of do some tea art on the sort of surface of the tea that Iroh doesn't notice until he gets over to her. So we'll get that reveal in a second. But uh, <laughs> what are your thoughts on this? The the, the spirits beginning to uh, meddle with Iroh's life here. Yeah, no, I mean, I guess spirits have, you know, some ability of telekinesis to be able to move stuff. I guess that doesn't seem too sort of out of the norm per se. Um, but, you know, I think, you know, it's an interesting setup here just to see that, you know, we have the spirits here and they're sort of being a little bit, at least initially, sort of mischievous. And you don't quite know where they're going at this point, but you do know that they're going towards something in the end, of course, because that's sort of how these things always sort of work in these stories here. But um, but no, I think it's a, it's a cute sort of like, I guess, classic setup for something that would happen. So, you know, I guess it works for what they're going for here. Mm. Yeah, it is an interesting one. Though. Like, OK, OK spirits can teleport like levitate stuff or whatever the only other thing i think of like is like did a spirit somehow like go inside the paper to move it that way but uh they didn't like visually <laughs> make it clear that they they did something like that but uh either way they, they have that effect so uh anyway iroh comes over to serve tea to lee may he's like it's nice to see you again this is becoming she says it's quickly becoming my favorite spot in bossing say you're the best tea in the city hands down and he uh, puts down the tea, <laughs> and it's revealed that the uh, spirit has the tea art that it's made is uh, two kind of love hearts, basically. And so Iroh realizes this last minute and is like, starts sweating, like, this is a little full on. And it's like, ah, Feng must have been practicing her skills. Please enjoy. As Iroh notices for the first time that, oh, there's the spirits kind of uh, hide, going to hide in the back, basically. Um, so he's like, what are you doing, little friends? And the little tiny little dragon bird thing um, lifts up the piece of paper that they used and it's revealed to be a flyer uh, that says the most romantic dinner in Bossing Say. And it's uh, a flyer for like a, a place to get a romantic meal together. And he's like, well, no, I, I can't listen, friends. Uh, I, I know you're trying to help, but uh, I really am content alone. And their response to this is to, again, make things levitate and hover that uh, they, they get all the cups and <laughs> pots and pans and stuff like that again form a love heart around uh, in front of Iroh to, to make it clear that uh, they think he should go through with this they think he's being silly for uh, what he said last night basically and he's like come on now uh, Feng says Iroh the customer wants more tea and he's like oh, I'll get on it uh, you, you go downstairs and I'll I'll, I'll, I'll get to it uh, he does make the same face that the uh, the the statue thing from book one that he he was looking at has again, so that's kind of cool. Um, and he's like, "Okay, you guys stay back here. No misbehavior in front of Lee May, please." As he walks out to uh, go through with what the spirits want, I guess. Um, but uh, what are your thoughts on uh, these couple of pages? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I guess it really shows you how I guess sort of uh, insensitive or sensitive. <laughs> Um, you know, the the spirits are trying to be towards, you know, getting Iroh to sort of, you know, set him up on the state here. And, you know, he's he's trying really hard not to sort of uh, be into it, even though, you know, he he's not like he doesn't hate the idea. He's just, you know, trying to, you know, sort of what he thinks is sort of like his places, you know, right now with things going on. Um, but you can clearly see that it's clearly not going to go uh, the ideal way that he wants to. And he's having to be in a, a couple awkward situations here for mm -hmm. sure. So he walks out with the tea again um, and is like, hello again, enjoying the weather. Yes, as we see in the background, a little green spirit begins to like lift up one of the uh, kind of pots in the background and begins to sort of tip it over uh, with the help from some of the other spirits as well. Uh, and he's noticing this and, he's, and she says, uh, I suppose it's getting late. So she's sort of preparing to go. And he notices in the background, the pot is now in the air. It's about to be tipped over. And she says, is everything all right? And he's about to say something. It's just that I, I, yes. A final look at the little green spirit. He's like, do it, Iroh, do it. Or I'll tip this pot over. And he finally <laughs> has to yield to the spirit. Would you like to accompany me to a late dinner? Uh, and she's like, oh yeah, of course. I thought you'd never ask. So he's he's gone through with it. She's agreed. And he's like, really? I'm, I'm honored to have your company. Let's Let me just close up. 
and it's revealed that uh, Feng also wants this to happen as well. Because she has overheard this and is just like, don't worry, I can finish up here. You have better places to be. Thank you, Feng. You're a truly kind and lovely young lady. Uh, and to you, my little friends, thank you for pushing a stubborn old man outside his comfort zone. Just don't threaten my shop next time. And she says, uh, I've never been to this restaurant. Have you? No, no. But uh, they do say variety is the spice of life. And sometimes we need new experiences to remind ourselves how magical the world really is. As we see, uh, I guess, the spirits uh, beginning to you know, swim around and interact with the uh, the food at the restaurant as well. Um, just getting across that that idea again that the I guess the spirits are nearly always around Iro, and so that's really interesting that he has a very strong relationship with them. So really kind of fun story here towards mm -hmm. the end, and he goes out on the date and. Uh, <laughs> The, the question obviously is like, do, does this go anywhere? If we see Iroh again in this era, is he going <laughs> to be, you know, together with Li Mei? Uh, I don't really see a problem in that. That he has another relationship that lasts up until he is about to die and meditates into the spirit world. Uh, seems fine to me. Uh, I'd actually be okay with this being a sort of meaningful kind of addition, like in a proper character who's actually going to be in a relationship with Iroh. But uh, your thoughts on the, the final uh, sequence of this uh, story? You know, I think I think that would be fine too as well. I mean, I think that could definitely add some interesting sort of dynamic, um, especially with, you know, everything that Iroh's had to go through in life that, you know, seems like something that would be nice for his character to sort of, you know, have throughout, you know, the later part of his life here. But yeah, I guess this it definitely shows, I guess, sort of, like you said, the strength of his connection with the spirits, which is something that we've, you know, obviously been aware of for quite a while now. But I guess, you know, maybe this is just sort of, you know, seeing how that's being represented now that we are more familiar with spirits in general, just through, you know, everything that goes on during um chorus time so now we get to see that sort of you know translate it to sort of you know the older era of things i guess you know maybe because the world is slightly more imbalanced the spirits you know depending on the person of course they're more willing to be around um you know different or particular people with you know strong, con strong connections with the spirits so i think this is definitely you know interesting to see i wonder if this will you know continue along the lines in terms of like seeing you know more spirits like this around like ang or other characters that have you know more of an affinity with the the spirit world and you know how that might sort of play out mm, yeah because because that's probably the big thing here it's just sort of um using the sort of like newer kind of material surrounding how you know spirituality works how spiritual people are how that like you know works basically Janora is obviously the main example where like this exact situation basically is happens to Janora in um the guide from book two is where we see that reveal that yeah she can just see spirits because the spirits choose to show themselves to her but no one else and um, and she has to sort of talk to them and say reveal yourselves to everyone uh, and again she also just has spirits around her full stop and we know she is one of the most spiritual kind of people of her her era and that's you know this is iroh's ability we mm -hmm. saw this in 107 in avatar where iroh saw like fang, uh, ang on fang as spirits and this was the reveal that oh iroh has a spirit world kind of dynamic connection and this sort of is a way of sort of like retroactively saying that it wasn't just that like because he went to the spirit world that he can now see spirit it's no, he was spiritual, so that's why he could see spirits, because he can see other spirits as well. Um, it's, it's just a nice kind of, uh, you know, in, in the different era here, just making the same connection that uh, Korra is making. Um, I think the, the, the spot that they maybe could have chosen to do something maybe a bit more significant for Iroh as a character is when he's sort of explaining in a way to the spirits why he maybe doesn't feel he can uh have a relationship here is this might have been the opportunity to bring up whoever Luten's mother was like Iroh's wife whatever happened there that uh something about that and that like 
he had a romance before and because of what happened there he maybe feels like he shouldn't have another one or something like that um i get it in that like that's information that like it's kind of crazy we don't know at this point why would they just use it in this comic but when are they are we are we ever going to learn anything about that it was just a potential opportunity to like there's another reason why you may might not have wanted to kind of go ahead with another relationship but more kind of meaningful i suppose one but it might have also kind of tonally made it a little too sad based on what could have happened uh so i, I don't mind that they didn't do that but there was maybe an opportunity um but uh, did you do you have any thoughts there on just the fact that you know referencing like iro and relationships and how there is that big kind of hole in his story surrounding who Luten's mother is and a lot we don't know about him yeah, I mean, I think, you know, there's a lot about Iro in general that we don't know. Um, you know, just his whole sort of, like, dynamic and relationship with his family, I think, is one that we sort of, you know, mention a bit in general. And, you know, not only just sort of his family, Lu Tang, and sort of how that sort of plays out. So, I mean, there's a lot with him. I mean, you know, we've always, you know, sort of thought that there could be, like, a comic or now that we're getting more one shots you know a story that's dedicated just to him and you know maybe doing flashbacks and stuff like that so you know there definitely is the potential to do it but yeah like i mean like you said doing it in this particular story you know definitely it doesn't feel to me like it would have been like the greatest thing to sort of put in the story especially not with where they're sort of going for this i mean i think if we were to see more of iroh in this relationship in the future then it would make sense you know to sort of bring that up at some point um just because you know it would make sense that that would be you know something that would come up in a relationship um you know just sort of you know what has happened to you in the past and stuff like that and obviously iroh has had a lot of stuff that's happened to him in the past some good some not so good so you know there definitely is a lot there to be unpacked, but yeah, and doing it in this sort of comic format, it wasn't really something that I particularly thought that would really be like something that would be, you know, touched on at all. Um, you know, despite not even really knowing what this, you know, other than a little bit of info we got ahead of time, what it would really be mm -hmm. about. But yeah, that's uh, basically been our review for the Free Comic Book Day book. It's really, really good. Both stories are great. Uh, but again, it's like, I almost feel like they, why didn't they in in the marketing <clears throat> do a bit of a better job at actually like teasing getting you behind why you should be interested in these books by like mentioning like flashback here's why you should read this book boom uh you know uh, and then with the iro one as well like mention like iro goes in the days and tease it that way um because they basically had the material there because if you look in the inside cover they have a proper description it's written from basically the dark horse comics team they don't put a specific person's name on it but they say uh free comic book day 2021 is here inside this comic you'll find two brand new adventures with your favorite friends from nickelodeon's avatar the last airbender and legend of korra first tenzin re re uh, relates the tale uh, of a fight he had as a youngster and what the confrontation helped him discover about his air nomad heritage but uh, uh but will that lesson work for janora iki and milo in our second story uncle iroh's tea shop is the center of some strange spirit activity humans and spirits together give iroh the push he needs to do something exciting that's outside his normal comfort zone it's a fun-filled double feature of laughs and lessons for uh, avatar core fans of all ages uh from the dark horse comics team now to be fair they do spell milo's name wrong so i get maybe why they didn't do that but it's also weird that that got through and that got published in the end like the main character's name being spelled wrong uh, but still that description people would have been hyped about that for months if you had put that up ahead of time but instead like it took basically until the day of the event and people realizing that like oh what we get to see appa katara ang to have an interest in this book because there was no hype behind this book for basically the four months or so we knew about it because they had no information about it initially and um, i just really kind of question how what happened here with this one and um, but uh, what are your thoughts on that how like they they didn't really hype this up until it basically was out 
Yeah, I mean, for the description part, I wonder if that's just like a late addition that they actually sort of went through with and maybe that's why the typo is there is because it was like a last minute, you know, sort of thing. Um, but, you know, with the way that they normally produce this stuff, you know, they knew the story in some sense well in advance of it actually being made, hopefully, most of the time. Um, so I don't know. But, yeah, no, definitely the I don't know. It seemed like the initial sort of idea hype of this was sort of like there you know just the fact that you know we're getting this comic is going to be a double feature and everyone sort of knows that it's coming um but like you said in the interval there definitely wasn't you know much to be about it i mean you know it took us forever to get the sort of cover there so i don't know i mean you know there's a lot of factors that go in with making these and maybe it really was sort of like even if it was announced early maybe it was sort of more of a, a last minute you know sort of get together for actually like producing the comic which is unfortunate maybe they were just you know with everything sort of going with popularity there was just like oh yeah we should do this and it'll be a double feature and it'll be cool can we do it sort of type of thing i don't know we'll probably never know from from that sort of angle of things but it definitely could have standard to be you know promoted a bit more mm -hmm. i think so the final thing is just that um as we've already talked about with the fact that there's been availability problems where actually people are getting a hold of the physical copy. And then for some people, like if, if you don't have a comic book store nearby or you're from a country that doesn't participate like at all, um, you kind of don't really have access to this book. And the kind of history, especially with these sort of like, because they are brand new stories, they're not just like teasers from books that are otherwise released. They're completely original stories all of the free comic book day books are like worth like a bit of money they're free comics but you typically do have to pay at least like five to ten dollars on ebay to like pick up one of like the the old books or something like that now i think the price has dropped a little bit on like the older ones because most of them have been reprinted in team avatar tales and the and the hardcover collection but all the Korra stories have never been collected like the we have a uh, Friends for Life, which is a Korra Naga story from a few years ago. And then the, what, the following year they did Lost Pets. And now we have this Korra story. But now we also have a individual avatar story out completely on its own. Um, so you can sort of see the idea that there's maybe a possibility somewhere they do a Korra short story collection and include the, the three free comic book day books mm -hmm. but they kind of have to start again with the avatar one and um, so uh when are when are we going to see some of this stuff get reprinted because at least to me this one cl uh, clean cleansing the air uh, and friends for life are like really really important stories and i think they need to be like as accessible as possible for people in like a physical format as well so what do you what what do you predict as being sort of like the future for these like will we get a Korra collection at some point and and especially the Avatar one what what do you think they're going to do with that for like future reprints? Yeah, no, that's that's definitely a good point to bring up because you know with Avatar in general, that's you know a lot of people do like collecting the stuff and having the physical forms of them, and I guess even just getting the digital ones up there as soon as you can would also be like. A great you know positive for it rather than you know like going on say like tumblr or tiktok or something like that to actually sort of find the comics or waiting for it to go up in in other places um i definitely can see the collection of the core ones like i don't see why they wouldn't do that like they've already proven that they will do that um you know for other ones so i expect that that will happen eventually um it's just sort of a matter of how long it takes to actually do that and if they want to make i guess more of them before they feel like it's really worth to do it i don't i don't know i mean they could also just sort of make one of the other sort of larger collections and sort of add those into it as well so you know there's a couple different ways that they could go about doing yeah. it yeah yeah i i can definitely see them doing like a team avatar tales Korra version type thing where they have a few new books but then they it's mainly a reprint for the the three we already have um the the iroh story um it's tricky but i could maybe see some sort of a thing where like we're expecting them eventually to announce like a, a library edition for the three one-shot books the suki toff and katara book like would it really be a problem to just have that to be like an extra in that book where like 
Mm-hmm. It's it's like an mm-hmm. IRL one shot to a degree, but it, like it's an extra story in what is primarily otherwise about the one shots. It'd save you having to eventually build up potentially a year or two to make more short stories. At least it's there in that book, and it, I get it's kind of weird that like you have a original thing that's just an extra in another thing, but it it's it's an option. Um. But I, I hope they announce something like that soon, especially just because we haven't had many Korra comics in that it still felt kind of unique and new reading a Korra comic like that, especially one that featured backstory like that. Um, so I, I hope they, they get on that. Um, I wouldn't mind if the rumoured, long rumoured next Korra comic was just a short story collection because it gives the option to then feature these <laughs> ones. But I also do want like a, a proper three-part story like we usually get. But we're still waiting on a lot of that stuff. And in terms of like news that we're expecting, you know, it, it, it actually has been quite a few weeks with like no announcement. And that I think we're up to February in terms of books that we know about. The last month hasn't seen a new Avatar book get announced. So it feels at this point like we're on the verge of once we finally get sort of the next announcement there'll maybe be a few at once where they'll announce what's next for avatar comics core comics the next novel um and some of those other like uh, reprint books like imbalance omnibus will they start to do omnibuses for the core comics um like i said the library edition for the one shots um and so on like when are we going to get information on beasts of the four nations uh when will we get preview pages for the chibi comic as well all of that stuff i think is expected before the year comes to an end so it's not like everything's completely over for the year but this free comic is the last new story content of the year uh, and there's still like four months of the year left so that's a little bit disappointing in the year where avatar studios gets announced we're done with story content in august <laughs> but uh, that's just the way it unfortunately works out and um, so yeah what are your thoughts just on, on on that i suppose that like yeah just w- in the remainder of the year what do you think they'll do in terms of like publishing announcements yeah that's a really good question i think i don't know i guess you know a lot of us you know sort of waiting for like you know maybe new york comic-con for things to be announced there or maybe around that time where to have some of the other sort of either makeup cons or other i guess sort of major events where they would you know potentially announce sort of things like that i mean i think you know with everything that's going on i think a lot of it is like what we've been saying been saying is more dependent on sort of like avatar studios and sort of you know them sort of leading the charge towards you know new content um you know there are you know like you said we were sort of expecting sort of like some news or some word of the core comics or individuals or you know maybe a series if they're really going for it but it definitely seems like you know like we've been saying for a while now that a lot of stuff is sort of being put on hold at least the more major story content driven things so yeah it definitely is you know i guess a bit sad that you know with there being so much more left in the year that we're still you know sort of waiting on things to not even come out to just be sort of announced that they're going to come out you know in the next year or two or so mm, yeah it, it's it's interesting because yeah like in a video i think yesterday or the day before i went over just like the release schedule of the books and the ba- basically it's like everything else for the rest of the year is, is basically out in September. Um, we're, we've got the Lex Omnibus, um, the volume two of the Screen Comics thing, the uh, the calendar is coming out at that point as well, the Korra Book 2 art book, second edition, all in September. Beyond that, I think the only other thing left in the year is like the, the cookbook in November and... Um, what's the other thing oh and the the box set of the kyoshi novels in october so like there's, there's nothing i think in uh december and then i don't think there's anything in january either and then february looks to be like the most expensive month ever for like avatar publishing stuff because there's like two hardcover books out 
in the same like like two or three week window uh, with Beast of the Four Nations and the uh, book three art book second edition and that's the same month that the Chibi comic comes out and it's the same month that the North and South Omnibus comes out in and it's actually the same month that they're planning to the to ship all the stuff from the Kickstarter out as well so September and February are like the everything is happening in those months uh, so it's it's pretty crazy that uh, they they don't spread the stuff out that much um, <clears throat> but uh, that's that's it for the, the the podcast basically this week uh, the next podcast um, I guess we'll do one to sort of cover stuff like you know how the Kickstarter ends up at the end there's only like what less than two weeks left so you'll probably see one to cover the news there and then beyond that like we've just discussed it's just whenever there's news about stuff that they sort of announce going forward uh, that's when we'll probably come back and hopefully New York Comic Con is where they will do some sort of a major avatar announcement with regards to first proper avatar studios information and maybe combine that with some of the publishing stuff also um, and then avatar legends we're maybe expecting some merchandise with that uh, titling to come out as well but uh other than that it's just it's waiting for news at this point so um yeah that's been the podcast episode 233 it's been myself and greg thanks for listening and bye 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 <laughs>